up on my own. To reconvene the meeting of the Columbus City Schools Board of Education, if you would all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Mary, if you would. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. A couple of housekeeping items before we start. If anybody would like to make public comment or would like to comment on an agenda item, if you would find the yellow card in the back, fill it out and pass it over to Sue on the side. I sure appreciate that. Secondly, uh, we have a lot of cell phones in the audience. I'm sure if you would remember to turn yours to off or vibrate or stun or whatever we're calling it. Okay? <laughs> All right, so let's move on to item uh, E, adoption and approval of the agenda. So moved. Did not hear any comments on making changes to the agenda. Second. Anybody no. no changes? All those in favor of the agenda as it sits? Aye. 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 Opposed? So we will play it exactly as it lies. Item F, approval of the minutes for August 19th, 2014. Do you have everybody here? So moved. Second. <laughs> Do we have any comments, changes, corrections, additions, clarifications? No? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Sue, I thought they were very well written. Thank you. All right, let's move on to item G, special recognitions, high school student representative school site reports. I'm assuming we've got uh, all four secondaries. We've got no, just the high schools. Is it just the high schools? Yeah. High schools. Okay. So, uh, because I'm always accused of bias. It's not even a chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with Casa Grande. I hardly ever accused you. I never said it was you. Hardly. <laughs> hardly. I never said it was you. Hardly. Good evening. I was the principal of Casa Grande High School, and I would like to introduce our ASB president and vice president, Emma Bryan. And Alex Mendoza will tell you about all the fabulous things going on at Custer Park. Good evening, my name is Emma Bryan. I'm a senior at Casa Grande and I'm also the ASB president. Hi, I'm Alex Mendoza and I'm a junior at Casa and the ASB vice president. Regarding our administration, over the summer, the amphitheater located in the LA Center in the middle of campus was completed. New technology was implemented in classrooms, such as MacBooks and uh, document cameras, to further, further develop the learning process. Assemblies by grade were also held at the, the second week of school as an introduction to the school, and it served to introduce our administration to the students. Back to school night will be held on Thursday, September 11th from 5.30 to 8.30 at CASA. And October, on October 15th, all sophomores and juniors will take the practice SAT during the school. The remaining students will have a late start of the day, much like the exit exam schedule in the spring semester. Our administration helps us taking the PSAT during school will encourage sign-ups in ASD, or, sorry, AP and honors courses at CASA. Regarding the classes at CASA, Mr. Merrick's graphic design class has students designing custom shirts and hats for clients, the first being the PCS warehouse. These shirts for PCS will be designed and screen printed by the students, who also printed shirts for the teachers at uh, Kenilworth Junior High School in late spring. The Mr. Merrick's 3D animation, um, about midway through the year, students will be enter entering animations in the countywide film festival that will be held on the big screen at Realto Cinemas in Sebastopol. And entre entrepreneurship, also taught by Mr. Merrick, his students will create their own business plans in the first semester, and each student Business will be involved in the holiday fair during lunch the week before winter break. Last year, one of Mr. Merrick's students took second place and with a $250 cash prize for her business plan, the Napa Valley College competition. This class will work with PVC again as well as this year. And the human interaction class taught by Mr. Merrick day, her students are taking field trips to see local agencies of COTS, PEP, housing, and Cypress School for children with autism. These field trips will aid and their decision of where they will be help, will be completing their required 10 hours of community service. Regarding leadership taught by Mr. D'Angelo, the leadership class went on a three-day and two-night planning trip to Florida <coughs> KOA this past August. It was a great <coughs> jumpstart of the year and a class bonding experience as well. 
The freshman orientation was held on Monday, August 18th, and was catered by Chuck Hughes Sakaria. The event served its purpose to familiarize the incoming ninth graders to the school before the first day. And a spirit renovation occurred on that Monday night in which leadership students decorated the school with green and gold to encourage school spirit on, the first, on their first day. And there's a Cancer Awareness Spirit Day on this Friday, September 12th. To go along with that, we're having an Orange for CJ Spirit Night at the football game this Friday as well. And this is in memory of CJ Banizak who passed away this summer with, from cancer and the sister is also a junior at Casa Grande. Casa Grande's 2014 homecoming theme is superheroes versus villains. Our homecoming rally and football game are scheduled for Friday, October 24th, as well as the election of homecoming queen. Each club chooses a senior representative to represent their club, but clubs cannot have a rep without a homecoming club participating in the parade, which takes place before the game. Homecoming dance is set for Saturday, August, October 25th. And regarding sports, girls soccer has not been scored upon this season, and they have either won or tied. And boys soccer has a new coach this season. Girls tennis participated in the California Tennis Classics Tournament in Fresno this past weekend. And girls golf has three away matches this week against Montgomery, Windsor, and Rancho Katani. Girls volleyball has an upcoming match this Thursday at Clayton Valley High School. Cross, cross country has won interlocking meet with boys and girls varsity placed second out of seven schools. They also have a scrimmage against Annaly High School at Annaly this week. Football's had a rough start to the season. We are motivated than ever to overcome the challenges and prevail through the tough teams. All the staff and students at Casa Grande are looking forward to our best year yet. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Jenna Teagarden, our ASB Vice President, and Ty Pearson, our Junior Class President. Are you allowed? What's going on? Hello. 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 Okay. Hi, I'm Jenna Teagarden. I'm ASB Vice President. And my name is Ty. I'm the Junior Class President. We are off to a great start. 1,367 students are hard at work and play at Petaluma High School. Our engineering and design program is kicking into high gear. We added two new sections of introduction to engineering design and an A to G course developed with Project Lead the Way to complement our principles of engineering course. Students now have access to a clear pathway to career engineering studies thanks to Jennifer Eaton and Chris Jones who spent part of their summer in Utah and at Duke University respectively getting trained for the program. Linda Judah and the Science Department have launched a Kids in Space program. She has partnered with the National Center for Earth and Space Science Education. Our students will create microgravity experiments, one of which will be chosen to launch aboard Mission 7 next year. We are still fundraising to meet a shortfall in funding. Already, various members of the community have stepped up, but are still, we are still short about $8,000. Ms. Judah has an Indiegogo program or page for donations if anyone is interested. Email Mr. Sturt if you need more information. This is an exciting opportunity to engage in real world science for our students. Ball sports is off to a strong start. Though football dropped a tough one to vintage last week, the program looks to be on the upswing. Tennis, soccer, volleyball, and golf look like they are all fielding strong squads. Check the Petaluma High School webpage for schedules and updates. There are lots of new staff at PHS and they are adjusting well to our school. Board members are always welcome to come and look around and check on out instruction going on. We held our first Treasure Connections of, the week of this year yesterday. This is our advisory period where we share school-wide information. As we did last year, leadership and ASB students are working with teachers during this time. In addition, entrepreneurship students are joining us at, in this endeavor. We, were over at WASP, we, we went over our WASP goals and, and celebrated our recent six-year accreditation, as well as covering organizational tips to academic success and showcasing our Back to School Week. And speaking of back to school week, today was our first rally outside at Ellison Field. Class competitions, ca class competitions, cheers, relay, and fun culminating in excellent sportsmanship by Principal Sturt. <laughs> Tomorrow we welcome Scott Vakovich, who is an experienced inspirational speaker. He will come to our school and talk about how our students need to be a catalyst for change. Thursday, new student lunch in the museum. We have approximately 30 students 
who, would, who we will be personally inviting to be welcomed to our school. Friday, we will have our, we will have our sixth annual Senior Sunrise, followed by club, club Rush and a tailgate before our home football game. September 22nd, we will, be hosted, we will host a Sonoma County Leadership Development Day presented by California Association of Student Leaders. We expect to have more than 350 student leaders from all over the county coming here to have professional leadership development. PHS leadership students will continue to build on the training we start at camp, and it is evident that they are ready for the job. Thank you. Thank you. representative this evening, uh, and her name is Hannah Dumonti. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you give him a you break. You can share the zoo. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> So far at Kenilworth, we have had the 7th grade dance, Hawaiian dress-up day, which included a lunch activity and dance, donut limbo, basketball tribes, and we have started our cost crunching chain. Ooh. Our leadership has organized the 7th grade dance, and we also set up all the spare days and activities that happen during lunch. Leadership has set up some fun and exciting events like Red, White, and Blue Day for 9-11, Pirate Day, Wear Pink for Breast Cancer Day, Western Day, Superhero Day, Color for the World Series Day, and much, much more. And for CJ, we created a spirit day for him. And on the spirit day, he wore orange because it was his favorite color. And we are also having a lunch activity in honor of him. And our principal uploads the pictures of all the events on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We have some fun lunch activities planned for the school year, including hula hoop and beach ball challenge, ping pong balancing challenge, and pirate races. We are also planning some fun dances in October, December, February, and April. Our school is hosting a pledge party. This is the only time of the year the school asks for donations. If a student participates in the pledge event, they get to go to the party. Our goal is to plan activities and events that make all students feel part of our wonderful student community. We hope that they have a great and fun year. Thank you and have a good evening. Jane. Hi, good evening. We are going to do a very quick review and final report on the um, goals for the 13-14 school year and uh, Dave and I are going to be doing that together. Um, I'll let Dave pass out the handout while we get this all organized here. I don't know if that's my eyes, but oh, there we go. Okay, so as you remember, um, over the course of the last year for 13-14, um, we had just two goals that we were working on in Petaluma City Schools. And goal number one was the implementation of Common Core. 
Um, our Common Core, um, we received some dollars from the state um, to help us with the implementation of Common Core. And you can see this is how we spent the, um, the monies. There is still some, a little bit of money left in secondary, but we have until June of 2015 to ex fully expend all of the funds. This is in line with the um, K-12 Curriculum Staff Development Committee, actually was the committee who, who helped make the decisions around how this money was going to be spent. And um, the technology to support education was our number one goal in using this money. So as you can see, we've met that with 75% of the funds expended to support in technology to support instruction. 20% of the funds were expended in instructional materials, and that's mostly around um, materials that were um, uh, printed, actually, for um, um, K-6 mathematics, since we have um, some pilot units that teachers worked really hard to put together some pilot units, and we needed, um, they were having a hard time accessing them online, so we printed the units for and made binders for the teachers. Um, there's also some other that we um, bought, purchased just a couple of instructional materials with this money to kind of fill in gaps as we move towards decisions and what we're going to do in the future around instructional materials aligned to Common Core. Those decisions will be coming for mathematics this year, in mathematics K-12 for this year, okay? Yes. So in theory, would all K through six teachers be using the same math program? They do not have the same math program right now. Um, what they have is um, all of the instructional um, resources, I guess I would call them. Um, they collected them up um, from a wide variety of places um, to supplement Envision Math, which is still our base program. And the um, resources are collected up from places like the state of New York that has a whole um, math program called Engage New York, the state of Utah, the state of Georgia, um, websites that are um, aligning Common Core instruction um, and providing all different kinds of lessons. So teachers decided that it would be, um, instead of committing to a whole program this year, that we wanted to try out a variety of different things before we started investigating programs. We'll start investigating those programs and the various resources this year so that we have a clear adoption for next year. So each teacher, teacher was given a binder with different resources. Yes, for grade it, the, grade levels, the grade levels came together and identified the resources. There was okay. a committee of teachers yes. and district employees that yeah. created the binder. Yes. Um, and all of the binders are aligned to the Common Core State Standards. <laughs> um, we also had an enormous amount of professional development. And even though it looks like we didn't spend that many funds because only 5% of the funds from this particular bucket were, bought, were, were um, used, we used other funds such as Title II and Title I and Program Improvement and really provided some great professional development last year for um, teachers um, in mathematics, um, working with Josh Dice, who was our consultant from the Sonoma County Office of Ed, um, and focused in on, all the professional development was focused in on Common Core aligned instructional strategies. And people were introduced to the instructional strategies and then got the opportunity to try them out in their classrooms a little bit and then come back and talk about them again and then take them back out and try them again. So the, the pedagogy, the thought around that and the reason that we did that is that the pedagogy is as important as the standards and as important as the materials, which is a little bit different look at um, a curriculum development sequence so that the pedagogy and how things are taught in the Common Core are so different from how we used to teach that we really focused first on pedagogy, and we're doing the same thing with English language arts, focusing first on pedagogy, and then finding the resources to support those, that pedagogy, and to really deepen the pedagogical um, skills of our teachers. Okay. 
Um, also in Common Core Implementation, you can see a little more detail there um, around the professional development. We are working very hard on our three focus instructional strategies this year, close reading, academic discourse, and writing from evidence, which are the core and the heart of the Common Core. K-12 curriculum staff development, again, that committee identified these strategies and really felt that it was important to focus and give people lots of time. So we'll talk more about that next time when we get to goals for 1560, 1450. Um, instructional materials, you can see what we're doing there. We're piloting an ebook in the eighth grade. Um, we have one class at Casa Grande using an integrated math program from the Carnegie um, Foundation. Um, and um, they just started that pilot, so it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. And then K6, once again, a variety of resources supplementing Envision. The technology to support instruction, you can see the detail there. We spent the, the vast majority of the money on the infrastructure and the, the upgrading of the in infrastructure so that we can stabilize the internet and access to the internet. Have we completed that project? No. <laughs> Is the internet stabilized? Not completely. But we're working towards that and we luckily our bonds passed, so that will give us the opportunity to really deepen that project and provide the kind of internet access to all students and all teachers so that we have a stable environment that will, will really promote instruction. And then, of course, the um, Smarter Balance pilot. <laughs> we tried Smarter Balance for the first time. Um, we bought a lot of extra Chromebooks and um, carts to put them on, a lot of extra resources for the kids to actually take the test. We have boxes and boxes and boxes of headphones and mice <laughs> that we lend out to the schools now so that they can actually um, um, take the Smarter Balance on, online. As you know, Smarter Balance this year becomes real. Um, we will. We did not receive the data from last year. We'll never see that data. Um, but it does become real this year, and our students will take Smarter Balance beginning in um, April. Okay? And the kids will take it 3 through 8 in grade 11 in math and language arts. Our second goal was LCAP and LCFF. And we're happy to report that the county actually accepted both. <laughs> and our LCAP has been approved by the county. That was a little sticky because it was the first time. And you know, um, you had to, we kind of had to guess because <laughs> we weren't quite sure what they were looking for. We had to use the template that was provided by the state um, that um, they will be changing this year due, because of in, input that they have received. Um, and how difficult that was to use. Um, we provided stakeholder engagement, a whole series of meetings <coughs> beginning last October and lasted all the way through May. Um, and this is what we had to include. We had to include goals and progress indicators. So there is a measure of accountability within this LCAP and that this, the county will be tracking and holding us accountable to. And then we had to identify actions, services, and expenditures. So it was in alignment. The important thing here is that there is alignment between the dollars that are in the LCAP and between the actions. That's what the county, that's what they're looking for. That's what it comes down <coughs> to. That the supplemental do dollars supplement instruction for EL, low income or socioeconomically disadvantaged students and foster youth. That FY means foster youth. So that the district provides the base program. It's just kind of like, think about it like Title I. District provides the base program and then this comes in and supplements that base program. And that's the intention behind the LCAP and the supplemental money that we receive. And then finally, if we use the money in a school-wide or a district-wide way, for example, we give professional development and we use the LCAP money or the supplemental funds to do <coughs> district-wide um, uh, professional development, then we have to justify that and why that's best for the EL students 
the SES students and the um, foster youth. Okay? So, yes? About the LCAP? Yeah. Explain to me again who was on the committee and how did that committee get established? Good question. Um, the committee was made up of about 30 people. Um, we had representatives from the board, administration, Mary was our representative, administration, we had teachers, we had students, and we had parents. So all stakeholders were represented with the, on the... Um, and classified. And classified, sorry. <laughs> All stakeholders were identified. Um, Loretta over there was our our, uh, um, our faithful <laughs> attendee. <laughs> no, we had Dorothy Morgan. And Loretta Bracco. And Loretta Bracco. Um, we had Loretta Squared. The Loretta, the Loretta I, as I call them. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and the, the, the team met um, six times throughout the year, really did a very good job of identifying, we did a needs assessment, we identified the, the gaps in where, what we were doing and how we might be able to use this money, and then aligned the funding sources to the gaps. Um, and now we're moving ahead with all of that. And that's the plan that ultimately got approved. And that is the plan that was ultimately approved. Okay. Posted on the website if you're interested. Shane, to what extent is there a learning curve there that's going to make this easier next year? Um, there was a big learning curve. It was a very steep learning curve because we had to learn, first of all, what the, what the state was asking us. Um, and it's also a different way of thinking. This is a different way of, we've had Title I money, so we're used to thinking about, okay, this supplements, this goes on top of, this is, so that part of it was easy, but the alignment between the services and the money is something that's different um, for districts. So um, that, was, that was a big learning curve. Also a needs assessment, a district-wide needs assessment, that, it, it's hard to do. And so it took us about two and a half meetings to really get the needs assessment completed. And that collecting up the data, interpreting the data, you know, figuring out what it says, and then making some conclusions, drawing conclusions from that data. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, process, it's a process that's different than um, some things that we've done in the past. So will you or have you uh, done a post assessment to see what went right, what didn't go right, and what will do differently next time? You are invited to the meeting on October, Yep, I think it is, <laughs> which is where we will be doing that, okay? Looking at, at how, did, how did it all go? That was a huge, for lack of a better term, suck of human resources. It was a huge suck of human resources. And you know, a lot of things like that, so yeah. anything you can do to make that more efficient. Well, yeah. but the, the, the process now is at least set up. Right. So yeah. that, that there'll be a new template, but at least we have a better idea. So that won't take as many meetings. No. And, and it will be reviewing and, and tweaking because it's a living document. It won't be creating from scratch. But. Right. And it was really the, the, the hurdle was creating that thing from scratch. Right. And bringing everybody, getting the whole committee on board and really getting us all on the same page in our thinking. Okay. Um, looking forward, these are the goals that are out of the LCAP. These are kind of the broad, big goals. You don't see any objectives tied to these goals, but you can see it's about college and career ready, that the kids are ready to be participating citizens in the 21st century, that the staff is supported to facilitate. That's a different word, because we've always said teach. And really, Common Core and 21st century learning is asking us to become facilitators um, of learning. Um, learning environments meet the 21st century standards. Um, that the rigor meets 21st century and Common Core. They're asking us to step things up. And finally, that there's an increase in parent engagement and student preparedness. And the, the committee was very, very committed to um, parent involvement and parent engagement, and parent involvement and engagement early on in order to get the kids to that goal of college and career ready. Okay. 
So now we've got some school climate data, and Dave will um, help with that. I'll be his. I'll be his band. Excellent. <laughs> so Jane worked really hard to find arrows that were pointing down. So you know, we're typically <laughs> during presentations when we're talking about things, but these are all numbers that we do want to have go down. Um, for student services, our big goal is to go through and have students that are physically, mentally, and socially prepared to be at school, to focus, to take in what the teachers are preparing for the day. And as Jane just talked about, parent engagement is one key. And once the students are in there, what the teachers are doing with those students in the classroom are huge. So we have some data around those topics. When we look at the last eight years, when we're looking at our attendance rate, you know, we have a 1.5% increase. But when you're already at a 95% average, that's huge to get that jump, to get that many more students in front of teachers and at school on a daily basis. The other side of that is, um, this is only eight years of data. If we look just 10 years ago, our truancy rate in the district was around 18%. We've been able to cut that significantly. And a truant student is officially a student that has three days or more of unexcused absence of 30 minutes or more in the school day. So we're tracking that by site by site. Um, Parents really love those letters that we yeah. send out. <laughs> those letters are 60% effective, the first one that they get. So out of every 10 kids that get a truancy letter, only four are getting the second truancy letter. And of those four, only one of them are getting the <coughs> truancy letter. So that intervention is, is very, very effective. Um, when we look at number of suspensions, again, if we look 10 years ago, we were averaging right around 1,800 suspensions a year. That number has been cut significantly. It's the work that the classroom teachers do, the counselors, the administrators, parent engagement and involvement, the prevention strategies that we have at the sites, and then interventions to eliminate recidivism are really, really important. So we've cut down significantly on the number of students that are experiencing a suspension event, and we've gone from more than 2,800 days of suspension a year to under 1,500 now. When we look at a typical classroom of 30 students, we used to have teachers that were having about seven of their kids every year that were facing some type of suspension. That's now down to less than three. That has a real impact in terms of what they're doing in the classroom, the, the commitment, the engagement, the relationship that students have with their campus. And they're, they're more engaged in the classroom, they're more connected to their school, they're finding another significant adult outside their family to, to connect with on campus. Um, the expulsion number is one that has stayed relatively flat, um, not only for these eight years, but the 10 years previous to that, that number is covered right around 40. Um, we unfortunately have a very, very small number because it's less than one half of 1%, but yet consistently we have about 40 kids make really, really poor choices, and the board is forced to take action in those situations. Um, the last two numbers are numbers that we're really, really proud about. When we look eight years ago, we were having between 125 and 150 dropouts a year. When the last data was collected for 12-13, last year the results aren't out yet, that number was down to 25. So we have, <clears throat> and we know who those students are. Many of them are still engaged in fifth year programs and they're still working towards their diploma. So they had to go from a rate that was hovering even before this around 15 to 18% to go to a 3.6 dropout rate. We're really, really happy with those numbers. We're keeping the kids longer, we're keeping them engaged. That last column again is something that we're really, really proud um, to see that, that number, 92.6 graduation rate. Again, last year's numbers have not been reported yet, so that's the 12-13 statistic. When you take Headland City Schools out of the county average, the county average graduation rate is 80%. With Pendulum City Schools, it's, it's about 82. Our EL students graduate in an 80% rate. We want to close that gap. We want all of our students up to that number. But having our students right now, 92.6, 93 kids out of every 100 that start with us as ninth graders are graduating in four years. So there's the data behind it. Questions? You know, I don't have any public comment cards on this particular app. Go to the board for questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. You know. Okay. Yeah. Bring slightly from tradition here. Let's take one minute. Thank you. Do I have any more cards coming my way? Alright. 
Sandra, I'm assuming this is budget. Sandra, this is budget? Yes. Okay, because I have one for you on the go too. Yeah, this is different. All right. unaudited actuals and um, this will be my final report to us to this evening wow. so I know wow. um, so I just wanted to um, give some overview on uh, on the budget when we adopted in the 12 uh, I'm, I'm sorry the 2014-15 bu budget on June 23rd you know we kind of tracked where what our estimates were and how we ended up Okay, for the unaudited for 2013-14. Uh, so when you look at our biggest chunk of revenues at this point, our local control funding formula, and 13-14 was our first year under this funding model. And we actually did not know our actual numbers until after, right, actually it was right before June 23rd, but we didn't even have time to run the software program and figure out what our actuals would be for 13-14. So considering the fact that we came within a couple hundred thousand dollars out of you know, $52 million, I feel pretty good about those estimates. Um, our federal funds, um, actually the difference between our federal funds and, and the unaudited at that time is really that the funds that we don't use in 13-14 get reduced and they carry over into 14-15. So there really is no difference there on the federal funds. We know what we're getting. There's no surprises on the federal funds, but that's what accounts for that difference. Um, other state, we were within a $100,000 of our other state income. Other local, a lot of this is grants and donations that come in and uh, just a variety of income on local sources. The combined total of our revenues, we estimated at June 23rd that we would have just under 68 million and that's where we were, within a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, so I feel pretty good about that. 92%, over 92% of our revenues uh, unrestricted revenues are based on the local control funding formula, which is this bucket right here. And the local control in comparison to all revenues is about 78%, so that's about that line there. On our salaries and benefits, again, we were really close on our projections from our uh, June 23rd projection compared to our final. Um, so you can see certificated, very little difference there, classified, and benefits. Um, when you look at the actual dollar amounts, when you consider that we're working with over $30 million in certificated salaries and not knowing exactly how sub costs will come in and the like, that's pretty good. We're within a half a million dollars of that $30 million. Um, classified, we were really good. We were in tens of thousands of dollars of our estimate. Benefits, um, again, some of those benefits are tied to sub costs, depending on where that falls. So, but we're still within, you know, a range of $14 million. In total, uh, we were just about $1.1 million difference between our estimate on June 3rd, uh, 23rd and our unaudited actuals. So that's pretty good. Salaries and benefits are the largest portion of our budget overall. And almost 88% of the unrestricted dollars is salaries and benefits. 80% if you took the combined restricted and unrestricted budget, it's about 80% of the total budget. Everything else, um, 
pretty much supplies, services, and then other outgo is, is uh, lease payments, for example. Um, but this is where we typically don't spend all of our money on the supply budget, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, a large portion of that is re related to the grants and donations that come into the district that don't get spent. And they're held in reserve, and they get added back to the budget in the following year. Um, and again, our mantra um, to our school sites has been spend the unrestricted dollars last because the unrestricted dollars are what we are able to control and make decisions on future spending with. For example, whether or not we have to do a, a textbook adoption, for example, or whether or not um, this is the money that we use to um, increase salaries and benefits. Um, services were pretty much in line. We did have some significant increase in our legal costs um, that are, they're not, um, they, they're unusual, but you know, they're not extraordinary. Um, anyway, so you see this big difference down here. Uh, we estimated on June uh, 23rd that we would spend 15.4 million, well, we, we always know that that is not going to be the case. It was just under $14 million that gets expended. So just to clarify, so is yes. that other restricted funds? This is combination. This is all, this all is restricted sides. and unrestricted. Oh, okay. okay. And a large portion of this, um, for example, if you look in the back of the financial statements, we have a huge component that is parcel tax dollars that is unspent and that and they're at the site level. Those again get carried over to the future for the site school sites to spend. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. <coughs> Special education. Um, with the change in local control funding formula, there's been a lot of change in, in how special ed revenues and, and expenses happen at the district level. Previously, revenues were taken off the top of, of the district revenues and taken by the county office of ed. The local control funding formula changed that. So even though we see an increase in our uh, revenues, part of those revenues already existed, they were just going to another place, and the expenses were already there. So it's really just kind of a shift um, of how things look. Um, I wanted to give an overview and try to, because it's a mishmash of apples and oranges at this point, with this particular program, I wanted to take a look at the overall expenses of the program. Um, and it didn't matter whether or not the revenues came here or to the county office. This is just expenses, how we look year over year. Um, so I took a, a look at our salaries and benefits under special ed. And you can see in 12, 13, we spent 7.9 million. And in 13, 14, we spent just under 8.3 million. Now part of that is because we added back eight, eight days. We added back um, five student days and three staff development days for our staff. And so that's a portion of why this is increased. Services, however, well, services would also increase too because of that reason, um, because we added five more school days. So that's, that's a portion of why that went up. Um, but in total, in 12-13, uh, we spent 13.6 million, and in 13-14, we spent a million dollars more on the special ed program. About 4.2% in the salaries and benefits. Again, that's with the elimination of the furlough days. And then the services, $684,000. Part of this is $185,000 increase to the SCO programs. Um, as you know, we started taking back some programs from SCO, and the warning from them was, okay, if you guys take programs back to your districts, what you leave us with are the more expensive programs to run at the, SCO, at the county office level. So that's about a 10% increase on the SCO side. 
they the cost per student went from about twenty nine thousand to about thirty one thousand um, dollars. The other component that we have are legal costs. We had huge legal costs in uh, 13 14s. Um, $176,000 more than we had in 12 13. So, special ed related only. So, without these specific you an example of a legal cost that happens? A legal cost that happens, for example, um, if uh, a family feels that their um, individual education plan was not implemented correctly, they can challenge that. And so with that can come placement costs to a non-public school or a non-public agency, and that's part of where that's coming from. Um, and then on top of that, they will um, collect legal fees from the, the district as well. So, and on top of it, we have our own legal fees to take care of with regard to those costs. So. That's not necessarily a combination of lawsuits lost. It's legal fees in the normal course of business. Well, it doesn't quite get to uh, a court case, but it, it is like, a, it's a mediation. Mediated settlements, basically. Um, so our non-public agency, non-public school costs have also gone up. And then there's some other services that I was not able to drill down enough to identify the other $95,000 in increases. Um, when I look, when I break out special ed between student services and transportation, um, transportation is really relatively flat considering the fact that we added back the eight days. Um, really, it's at a, a break even. Um, student services, however, there's the million dollar um, increase is actually student services and these type of costs. Any other questions on this? How, how well do you anticipate these costs? Um, it's, well, the legal costs are very difficult and actually, some of these other costs are very difficult because you, you could have a student move into the district and with high needs and boom, it can cost, it, it can cost plenty. We, we have some students who can cost $100,000 depending on their needs. So it can be quite costly and, and it's not easy to predict. Okay. Ninja, most, most of those are being placed outside then, right, to non- Public placement? No, no, not not always, and it really just depends on the students' needs. A lot of times we are bringing them in and, and providing them service here, but for example, a full inclusion one-on-one aid can cost you know, forty thousand dollars with benefits and everything. So I mean, it's not, it's you know, it's not cheap to operate the special aid program. Any other questions? And then do we continually track those students that are with their IEP? <coughs> some students make movements, maybe even more serious or different sort of placement, some move back into the classroom with an aid or without an aid. Mm -hmm. So that's on an annual basis. Um, there's annual IEP updates, right. there's meetings, and then there's a triennial, 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 did I say that right? Mm -hmm. um, evaluation of student needs. Um, which is a deeper, a lot more testing involved with that. So yeah, there's, this is highly regulated um, with regard to laws, with regard to staffing um, and services. Okay. Um, yeah, I want to ask a question, and I think it's important to tell the audience. Yes. Yes. Is it restricted funds? We get some restricted funds, but we don't get enough. We don't get enough money from the federal government or the state government to cover the full cost. So then it's unrestricted funds that are used to supplement. Yes, absolutely. In fact, Mitch, it is, is it still what has been the past trend? We get about we're supposed to get forty percent covered by the feds, and we get about seventeen percent. Yes. So that same delta, about twenty-two. It's uh, off the top of my head. I don't. I I couldn't tell you, but it, it's in that ballpark. So if they're not paying us the money they say they're going to pay us, and we have a million dollar 
increase, then that comes out of our general fund. We can then not use for other things. That's exactly right. Because uh, those, those are prior expenditures. They have to be made. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, by law, we have to. Yeah. I mean, you want to, but it's also mandated. Yes. And the cost of not being in compliance would be even far greater. You mean your legal so, fees would go up a little bit? Yeah, <laughs> just a little bit. Just a little bit. Uh, let's see. Okay. So our average daily attendance, this was at our adopted budget. These are our final, oh, I have one extra column in here. Sorry about that. But really, this is where we ended up for 13, 14. 14, 15, you could see that we were just, you know, this is what, yes, this is right, at adopted. And then in 15, 16, we're, we were estimated, estimating that we would grow by another 52 ADA. And then, you know, half that as much in 16, 17. And in here, this red, this red number means that we're relying on the prior year average daily attendance to use for our funding multiplier, okay? So as you can see, if we're either growing or if we're at, if we're the same, these numbers are in blue or black in the positive mode, meaning that we're using the current average daily attendance for funding purposes. So it's just to make sure everybody's clear. So yes. you're saying that in 2016, 2017, mm -hmm. because we're going down, we actually use the 2015, 2016. Yes, that is correct. <coughs> that is correct. So as long as we're declining, we always get to go back one year. Yes. That is true for the, the elementary and the high school district, but that is not true for charter schools, for example. Charter schools are exempt from using prior year ADA for funding purposes if they're in a decline mode. So we won't have that benefit for them if they're in a decline. And actually, Pengrove, Pengrove came in about 20, 25 students less than we had anticipated. So that's a direct hit. They don't get to have a year to deal with that. And 25 kids is really one class. You know, that's one FTE difference um, for that school site. What's the dollar amount of the thing growing child? What do we get for a year for a child in the charter school for that? Um, probably around $7,200. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, well, I'll have other questions, though. I'm yeah. sure of it. They may be different, but, you know. $7,200 or so. In that ballpark, yes. So when we look at our ending balance trends with the unaudited actuals, that means that the auditors have not come in yet and verified these balances that we have closed the books at. Um, in, we have a total income of just under 68 million total expenses of just uh, just under 68.6 .6 million. So our net increase decrease shows 856 thousand dollars. But of that amount, I mean, if if you go look at the financials, we're actually deficit spending by about 1.4 million dollars on the unrestricted side, which is really the side that we need to focus on because this is not as high. Basically, we've spent down, or some, we have a higher um, restricted side of our ending balance. I know that might be a little challenging to understand, um, but that's okay. That's why you hired me. Um, this netted against our beginning fund balance. Our ending fund balance for 13-14 is 10606 And our reserves, less our 3% reserve, um, other reserves, for example, um, uh, grants and donations are included in that reserve that will get budgeted out in 14-15. We have just under $200,000 for the supplemental early retirement payment. The last payment that will be made in 14-15, that's included in that number. Um, what else is included in that number? Our reserve is over two million dollars of that. The, the reserve so reserve for economic uncertainties, the three percent reserve, which is based on the, this total expenditures. Um, we have we have restricted reserves, 
And the bulk of that, for example, $2.2 million of this number is restricted lottery. It is our parcel tax money. And there's one other thing. Oh, the remaining dollars for the com one time Common Core uh, uh, state standards implementation. Okay? So that's what makes up this. When you look at 1415, um, these numbers are updated. Um, and we're anticipating that we are deficit spending by just under $2.5 million. Um, 1415 includes a tentative um, uh, settlement with our bargaining units of 2.5 percent. Not a tentative settlement, but a, our, is your, our current proposal. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Thank you for clarifying that. Our current proposal of two and a half percent um, across the board for all employees in the district, plus uh, $500 one time per full-time equivalent FTE uh, to help absorb, uh, for the employee to help absorb the cost, increased cost of health benefits, okay? So this is where we're getting, this is the bulk of the reason why we're deficit spending. So this deficit comes straight across <coughs> and hits our unappropriated, unrestricted reserves. And so you can see that this minus this is giving us that 3.5%. Um, in 1516, we see that we're just barely breaking even. And in 1617, we were estimating that we were $1.2 million to the good based on our enrollment projections when we adopted the budget. However, um, and you can see that we're, we're exceeding our reserve requirements by these amounts down here. However, we just received our update on our 10th day enrollment numbers, and they did not come in looking as we had expected them. So since, since our funding is primarily based on our average daily attendance, that has an impact on our income, this line here. So elementary is down by about 115 students. Um, in this, in in fourteen fifteen, we're even uh, we're using prior year ADA um, to fund fourteen fifteen. So at elementary in this year isn't going to be affected as much, but it will be affected in fifteen sixteen and sixteen seventeen. And I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. This causes our um, out year decline of approximately two hundred and eighty seven thousand dollars. And it's not as bad in the elementary because I was already using prior year um, ADA estimates in my multi-year projections. Our bigger hit is going to come on the high school side. And even though the current year is only down by 26, we were estimating growth of another 20 in this year. So that, you know, that's not good. Um, in 1415, the high school district will be hit with about $158,000 in the out years because of our projections. It's roughly $868,000 plus that 158 that will have a multiplier effect in the out years. So, Liz, when you do that projection, <coughs> excuse me, in the out years, are you taking today's 10 day enrollment? and affecting the projections that you had previously made in the budget that was adopted? Yes. Okay, so if it was, say, 7,000, around whatever, and we're down whatever it is, you, you would subtract out 130, 140 from that. Right, that's exactly right. Each year going out? Yes, okay. because we have no way of knowing whether or not, you know, things are gonna bounce back. We have had odd years where we do bounce back, We've had bounce backs that happen after the 10th day enrollment. It's a little bit tricky to, to um, predict. But the other thing that happened, and, and one reason why we believe that we're down as far as we are in elementary is about five years ago, we were being hit with the recession. 
Well, when that happens, people stop having kids because they're not going to have kids when, when, you know, financially things are so um, upside down. Um, yeah. So then what I mean, <clears throat> excuse me again, how many times during school year do we true up the actual ABA? Oh, multiple times. Um, it gets reported um, <coughs> typically at the first interim, the second interim. Um, when we come back to you with the governors, I'm sorry, for the purposes of actual oh. dollars to us. Oh, so, we, so somebody shows up here three weeks from now. So basically, oh. we use CBEDS, which is the first Wednesday in October, which this year is October 1st. So that'll be that's the basis for all of it. But then during the course of the year, we will track the monthly enrollment reports that we provide the board right. and make sure that's in line with our projections. So as we come back and we calculate for first interim, we'll use CBEDS. Second in our room, we will look at the fifth month or sixth month report and see if we're in line yeah. based on ADA. And you know, I, I still didn't ask that question correctly. Uh, at what point, uh, tell me, okay. at what point Let's see. Does this, do we report to the state of California and the state of California says you have 7,000 students, and right. this is what we're going to pay you to based on that. Do we do it more than once? Does oh. it happen every month? Yes. No, we do that three times a year. Okay. But so, the number that really counts is P2. Right. Okay, and that is? Second so, principal apportionment. It will occur approximately, is it this year, 7th or 8th month? Uh, it, I haven't looked at the calendar, but it's usually like March or April. That's when, those are the numbers that really count. So if we got in 100 students after that P2 cutoff date, it doesn't matter. We don't get funding for them. Mm -hmm. um, what matters is everything that happens prior to that. So the attendance factor is really, really huge, you know, from the start of school all the way up to that P2 point, which again is in, in mid-spring. Well, we're not going to see growth like that before mid-spring. Um, stranger things have happened, but we can't count on it. We cannot count on it. We can only count on the pushes and the seats. Yes. Do you, do you have any feeling for historically the tenth day enrollment compared to P two? Um, I think it's been. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's fairly predictive. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's it's fairly predictive. Um, it's what we base the staffing on. So there'll be a realignment um, of staffing based on these numbers. So some school sites may lose portion or an FTE because the the, the numbers are down to help balance that loss of revenue. So. Yeah, and those are hard choices. I mean, obviously, that really impacts the school sites that have already planned and ramped up and added staff. Telling another, you know, telling a group of students, well, you're no longer going to be in that class is really difficult. Any other questions? On this? So this is what it looks like when we make those adjustments in the out years, for example. Um, you can see that we went from being a positive six hundred and seven thousand dollars. We're now deficit spending by a half a million dollars because of that change in the ADA estimate. And these are, I want to clarify that these are really rough numbers. I mean, we have not gone through and re-looked at our um, uh, enrollment figures for future. I mean, these are very rough rough estimates at this point. Um, and then instead of having $1.2 million out here, you know, now we're just at barely a break even in 16, 17 because of that. Okay. <clears throat> For first in room, we'll be looking at really heavily at our enrollment slash average daily attendance rates and making sure as best as possible, because they are projections, they're not forecasts, um, that we're as accurate as possible going forward. Um, we'll be looking at the change in the deferred maintenance transfer. Um, 
As you'll remember, a number of years ago when we were finishing the construction of the Ken new Kenilworth High School, uh, Junior High School, we uh, were anticipating selling surplus property at Casa Grande. That fell through. We wound up having to take out an $8 million loan to pay for the completion of the junior high. Well, one of the things that happened as resources went down, we started using redevelopment agency dollars that can be used for one of two things, either uh, capital projects or deferred maintenance. It has to go into some sort of building funds. If we don't transfer out of the general fund, they just say, oh, it counts towards your revenue. Well, in this case, your local control funding formula, and the state just takes that. So we do need to transfer it out. And actually, it makes sense for us to continue you know, uh, do deferred maintenance on our facilities and the like. So now that we don't need that money, the redevelopment agency money to pay off the loan, because the loan was paid off when we issued the bonds. And that was over $6.3 million of the bond funds to pay off the Certificates of Participation loan. We can now shift the redevelopment agency dollars into the deferred maintenance instead of using general fund dollars. And so that's going to save the general fund about $330,000 starting in 15-16. And that's not reflected in the multi-year projections that you see. The other thing that and, and we're not going to know the outcome of the adult ed consortium agreement with the junior college. That's one of the governor's initiatives that he has on the, um, for the, that started in the 13-14 um, year, is the discussions that our adult ed program become commingled or taken over even by the junior college. And so the adult ed funds, as you'll remember when we uh, before we took significant cuts. The adult ed program um, was restricted. We would, it operated in its own fund. When we went into the cuts, the adult ed program became part of the tier three, which meant you could, you could decide whatever you needed to do to bolster up your K-12 program. And so we continued to transfer $643,000 of the $1.2 million that went to adult ed to support adult ed education. And the general fund kept the others so that we didn't have to make cuts on the K-12 side. Um, if this consortium, depending on how this thing develops, there's a potential that we would stop contributing that $643,000 to the adult ed program and it would remain in the general fund. But that remains to be seen. But I just want to put that out there. Um, and oh. that's all, folks. Oh. It's been a pleasure serving Petaluma City Schools. Au revoir, my friends. set aside in salaries and benefits that was not used. But it was overestimated by $1.1 million. Back to that slide when you went back. I don't know which slide you're referring to. The slide where you estimated the expenses size. versus what actually it cost. I, I'd rather just call it right up because I don't yeah. want to guess what you're talking about. And while she's looking for that, when there are less students, there are less teachers, so there's less salary. Was that incorporated when you went to the No, not scenario? yet, because it depends. I mean, it's not an automatic. I mean, there's things that go through, and that has yet to be determined. That's an HR process where, no, I did not okay, account so for that. that. It, okay, I just wanted to be clear on that. And while we're waiting, 
we got our last budget, sorry, I got two points. We got our last budget from the, from administration 527, at which time you were projecting the 2.7 um, million in um, deficit spending. It was only 800,000 is what it ended up. When I look at, I'm looking at your unaudited Well, that would not be the last update that you've gotten. Every time we do a budget update, you're, pr you're This is what you gave us that. that we negotiated with last time. You gave us three budgets that day. They're all time stamped. This. They're all, I took your best case scenario. Mm -hmm. There were three. So my question is, that was $2 million, pretty much, $1.9 million. I noticed that 1.4 of it went in restricted reserves. So I had a question what exactly that was. So salaries and benefits certificated, uh -huh. um, we were within less than a half a million dollars. Um, Which way? Well, Which on our it? June 23rd, on our June 23rd budget, uh -huh. we estimated that Again, we would spend about 30.8 million, mm -hmm. but sub costs are difficult to predict and they're not known, but regular salaries are very easy to predict. Um, we were less than a half a million dollars within that estimate, which is pretty good. But a half a million dollars would almost be a 2% increase to your offer to us. If you looked at the cost but, of salary. But we don't, we don't micro, well, that may be true, but we that's at the cost of one percent. What matters? What matters at this point is what this unappropriated amount means, right. yeah. which is much higher than what you thought it would be in our last budget. I guess that's what I'm. There's the two slides down. That one. Yeah. Right. And when we got it, I made copies for you guys so you could see the one that I was going with, the unaudited actuals that we were looking at. I'm, I just want to share one thing, is that the budget is a living document. Right. There are factors that change it every single day. We can have a lawsuit, set, oh, not lawsuit, but a, a mediation settlement that can change it just like that. It's the way it is. If, our, uh, if we have kids who, there's a flu epidemic or whatever, that has an impact on our revenue just like that. So the budget is a living document. It changes every day with everything that goes on in this district. But since I've been on budget committee, I have to, what I've noticed is it's always about $2 million better than what we say, which was still this year. If you go back years and years, there always seems to be more money. But I, I will watch. Oh, it's, it's kind of a principle of budget. Don't you always, you, you go very liberal on the expenses as a general rule, and conservative on you, correct? Because yes. you don't want to go the opposite way because that's right. a disaster. We always anticipate that we're going to have at least a million dollars more yeah. than we have in the And to what they're speaking to, is that the bottom line goes down to reserve, right? I mean, the state starts getting concerned at 3%. Right. <laughs> but um, I think last time we talked, we were like 8, 10 trending down. But the average reserves are, are, are I mean, in many districts, is about 15, as I understand it. Some, some are as high as 20, yeah. correct? Um, but it, isn't that why to take out what, what Saunders bringing up, these, these dips and doodles and some midges point, is try not to guess to the penny every week. It's like we have reserves so you can handle the dips and doodles, correct? Correct. So, and we take into account the fact that we anticipate having um, approximately a million dollars more than than the budget. And that's, but that's, that's a year over if you year. Look at, every year you're going to have that. So correct. it's not a million dollars new every year. It's correct. the same million that you want to have basically in reserve. Mm -hmm. So right. that you can handle fluctuations in enrollment right. and fluctuations. Yeah. So if you go back, Mitch, to the business been on audit, because the last report that the board saw was um, budget. I mean, that's the total. This is the bulk of where we spend our money. This is, you know, between if you're looking at just the unrestricted side, you're looking at just under 88% of the unrestricted budget being salaries and benefits, and it's 80% of the total combined restricted and unrestricted budget. on the budget. far right, the difference between the amounts is about $900,000. Right, right, yeah. So $900,000, I mean, that's where the bulk of the million dollars comes from. Mm -hmm. So it comes from employee salaries. 
that million was saved from us not having a raise for seven years. Well, no. No, that's no. not to do with the raise. That's what it does. When you're so telling no. me that money is, is there and I see that five million and our people, our, your employees, yeah. have gone seven years. Six of those we took pay cuts. So you're saying there's a million. We always know it's there. It's time for the board to get specific and start really looking at the budget and find some money. We're not we'll get into that later, but I wanted to bring up I see there is five million. When I was the money has changed from what we were told what we were negotiating on is this side, the unaudited actuals is this side, there is more more money on this side than what we were negotiating on. So this is a better picture than what the last time we were told the budget. So I have copies of that, you can see that for yourself. Okay, that I don't understand because it appears to me that this is worse. This is what we just got today. And There's worse. Here, let me give you what we got. Well, it, it, that's fine. Well, the unaudited but actuals to. You still have to look at what going we got now. <coughs> but adopted to now, it is better. That's where that million dollars approximately shows up um, at. So this is second interim, I would guess. So I, I also want to share that this is restricted and unrestricted. And a lot of the dollars, what can we spend that amount? The, 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 you know, for example, Common Core money is included, the carryover that was not spent is a component of this. Um, Title I, if there's budget in the salary and benefits area, that's part of that figure too. So you have to disaggregate it. If you're going to get into this kind of discussion, you really have to look at what's on the unrestricted side. And Mitch, if you can just go to the ending balance transfer, the unaudited actuals. Yes. So if you look at, so taking into consideration here is the 2.5% plus the $500,000. So of that 5.295 million, we're spending uh, 1.8, roughly. 1. How did you get 1.8? The difference between 5.25. 295 and 3.567 oh, very, very well. um, on the bottom unappropriated reserves. Mm -hmm. So we're we're spending more money than we're bringing in is our projection. And even if you threw a million dollars up above, we'd still be spending a million four more. And that's only on the unrestricted side because on the on the restricted side, we expect to spend all of the funds. Or if you look at it, there's a slight change between the 5.3 and 4.8. Those are dollars that are allocated to be expended in 14, 15 out of restricted reserves. Right. So, so we are spending the dollars. If you could go through that slowly, Steve, to sort of point out the actual numbers, like 5.3 million. So, so well, yeah, did it, did it, that, that decrease to the fund balance of projecting the 2.45 million up above? So that we're, we're saying that, or the board has committed part of that five million dollars towards the salary increase to employees um, that has been um, proposed. And with that, we have a reserve going down to 3.5 million dollars from 5.23, almost 5.3 to 3.567. So when you're spending your reserves, obviously you're spending more money than you're bringing in. Those are one-time funds that this board has said we will spend on ongoing expenses. Always a concern um, because at some point in time, you don't have those one-time monies to put to it. You have to have ongoing funds to support it. Well, I, I do understand it, but I've been on the budget committee a lot of years and it's always more than a million dollars. Go back through history, look at where we are and what's, if it was, it's always more. I can guarantee you that from my time. But it's worst case scenario all the way down and there's no, like the 100 less students, that's fewer salaries, that is, but that's not incorporated. It's constantly it's not incorporated because we can't lay off teachers in September. We probably didn't hire them. You can attend ten days, that is the rule. Sadly, that is the rule. But it can be Well, we have a meeting tomorrow to discuss, yes, we do. To discuss that. So yes. we'll Sandra, can you, um, it's five minutes per speaker, so yeah. I'm kind of going, you know, good So you want me to go into negotiations while I'm up here? No. 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 no.
What? And we'll have that okay. 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 So let's go to Connie. I saw That's Connie. Okay, I'm going to yield to the next person in line. That's going to be Elizabeth Clary. Is it Clary? I'm sorry, is it, is it Clary? Clary, yeah. Hello, board. Um, I'm Elizabeth Clary. My daughter Julia is a first grader at Valley Vista, and um, we've made a conscious decision to support public education, to attend the school in our district. We've actually since moved, but we've stayed at Valley Vista. Um, and I just wanted to say I've, I've participated in a number of negotiations throughout my career on both sides of the table. I'm sorry. Um, the light's right in her face. It's okay. It's, I feel like I'm <laughs> um, it's good. I'm, I'm fine, Mitch. Don't worry. Okay. I, I, I am no, anticipating more questions. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. I'm totally fine, actually. Thank you, Mary. Um, better. I, I participated in a number of negotiations on both sides of the table um, throughout my career. And just from an outsider's perspective, um, from a parent perspective, I just want to share with this board and with the superintendent that um, I'm increasingly nervous about the lack of transparency with regard to negotiations and the budgetary process. Um, I feel like there are just some um, priorities that maybe are not being shared or not being discussed uh, within this process. And um, I get concerned when I hear things, you know, in the Argus, like observers are not being allowed at negotiations, um, that there is a lack of communication between teachers and the board and the superintendent and that there's a lack of professional respect. It makes me really nervous, um, not only as a parent, but as a taxpayer, and also as, as somebody who really cares about the future of public education and about the educational experience that we're delivering to students in this community. Um, and so I guess my question, and I'll just leave it open, is um, how is Petaluma City Schools working to um, ensure transparency in these processes, and not just in these processes, but beyond. Um, and I'll just leave you with, you know, I've been really trying to get into this budget and really understand, um, not obviously what's on the table now, but what's been done in previous years. And it is tremendously difficult to even access documents. And um, I just really, I believe that this district um, and its administration have an obligation to taxpayers, parents, and, and the students and the teachers. Um, so I'll just leave you with that open-ended question, and uh, thank you for your time. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> the document piece concerns me. Okay. Your um, inability to access. So can you give me? Maybe it's my fault. <laughs> no, but tell me so we can uh, make sure that you. But I, I have that. tremendous difficulty not only navigating the district's website, but also finding documents that I, I mean, you know, it's not just the budget, it's even, you know, the lunch schedule. Um, that, that makes it really difficult as a parent to um, just know what's going on sometimes. Um, and, you know, even the district website makes it very difficult for parents to know what's going on. And so, you know, our schools are developing their own websites, but um, I really believe that the communication is incumbent upon the district, so. I want to make sure that you have not asked for something that you have not given. Well, I'm asking here. I probably could go through other uh, formal channels, but I figured I would just no, share that while I'm here. <laughs> documents or, or, I mean, a budget or sure, an sure. Or I haven't gotten to that point yet, but okay. I certainly will ask. Okay. Yeah, but thank you. If you have a problem and you don't get it, I'll, I'll give you a call. I'll let you call. Right, thank you. Thanks. Jeannie, are you still here? I know you have to run to get the kids or something. Hello, I am Jeannie Pretzel. I am a parent of a fifth grader at McKinley. I'm a teacher at third grade at McDowell. I also had a lot of experience with budget, school budgets in the past. And I know that um, they're confusing and they're complicated and it's hard to know how much money is coming and um, it's hard to know exactly where the money is uh, and that also, as I was looking at this, and one of my co-members here brought up the point that you can't say that you're, this is how much money you're going to have if we have declining enrollment if you're not budgeting in the loss of teachers. Okay? If we have 200 fewer teachers, students, we are not going to have so many teachers. And you can't look at that and at those numbers and use them for your projections 
and say that's valid. Even if we don't lay people off, we will not be hiring people. And there will be people who will be retiring, and you have to take that into consideration too. Okay. Secondly, I would like to bring up the point of priorities. Budgeting is all about priorities. And we have felt for seven years, we've taken sacrifice with a smile and a bow to try to help keep this district going. Mr. Bowman has done an incredible job with the budget in the past. And we were one of the most robust budgets districts probably in Northern California, not the whole state because of his conservative financing. Okay, but now is the time to put a priority back on the teachers and a priority back on giving us back what we have sacrificed. You can um, say, okay, we've, we've given you two and a half percent. That does not look like a priority to me, especially when there's money being spent in other areas. If we are a priority and you care about us the way the community does, and we heard them out there, you probably heard the honks, the community is behind us. And they are asking you to respect us and support us. And if you haven't heard from them yet, you will be. You guys can make more happen than has happened. And you should be asking questions. If the teachers are a priority, then why are we adding more administrators right now? Because it doesn't feel to us like, like we're a priority and that's happening. And we're still not even able to come close to the cost of living increases in this town. Um, one other thing I was going to bring up later, but I'm just going to tag it on right here now, here, is that this is the third month in a row that I've been here asking questions along with a slew of other community members and teachers, and we have yet to hear a response. And I want to, you know, back, backpacking on Ms. Clavey's comment, where is the transparency here? We are asking you questions, we are making real, really valid points, and nothing is coming back to us. We have heard nothing except for Mr. Bowman's statements to us in emails. But none of you have responded to any of our concerns or questions. And that, I don't think, is the way you need to be responding to what we're giving to you. I apologize, I didn't fill out a card. Uh, my name is Jim Sorrett. I'm the Deputy Superintendent of the Sonoma County Office of Education. Um, and I want to first let you know that I am the reason why Midge is leaving. She's taking my position at Ross Valley School District. So. Yeah. <laughs> 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 to see the work that she did tonight, you, you're going to really miss me. So congratulations on that. Um, but I did want to come here tonight and just share a few comments in terms of some of the budget pieces that we are observing at the county office regarding Pattern of City Schools. Um, you've probably noticed already, but uh, we are um, required by law as part of our responsibility to uh, provide oversight to the school district's finances and its budget, to review the budgets, and to provide uh, basically approvals uh, regarding those budgets. And you should know that the budget that was presented to the county office for the 2014-15 school year, a budget approval letter is on its way. And it will be approved as presented. Uh, we are a little late on that simply because we had been overwhelmed by the LCAP reviews that we uh, had, were required to provide for the first time ever. And that was a challenge and I heard some of the comments heard earlier tonight and I would concur that was uh, a learning experience for all of us. So we're a little late on that, but it is on its way. But um, I've taken the time over the last couple of days to look at the Petaluma budget in detail, and I do see what I saw here described tonight is that what I would call a developing trend around deficit spending. Deficit spending simply is your expenditures that you're committing to on a year-over-year -year basis are exceeding revenue. Um, Midge's report indicated uh, that $1.4 million uh, of unrestricted um, expenditures uh, exceeded your revenue level for the 13-14 years. So there's a, a, a deficit spending um, pattern there. The, the adopted budget, the number goes up to $2.4 million. 
Um, and so we would share with you a level of concern that um, basically when you are deficit spending, you have to rely on reserves to fund that deficit until such time as the budget can be balanced again. Where does that, what are those reserve dollars? They're one-time dollars. They are coming out of the bottom line of the budget. So we do have some concern when we see developing um, uh, deficit spending trends. And I just wanted to come here tonight and share with you that we have observed that. Um, and I have to say that the information that was presented tonight and was shared with me um, a few days ago when it was learned that the enrollment numbers did not materialize as projected and obviously those deficit trends will go deeper uh, in the future as you saw the numbers here tonight. So um, just as from the regulatory agencies responsible for reviewing and approving your budgets, we, we do have a, a level of concern regarding that development we have. We have to answer your questions. So when you're looking, obviously you're looking at and trends of, of deficit spending, but when you look at reserves in our local county, um, what what starts raising red flags in our reserve? A specific number, or is it more of these trends? Well, the state of California requires, I believe, a three percent reserve here in the Santa City Schools. That's the, the, the code that delineates what we expect to see in that. So, the any dollar, I think that was a two million dollar figure. And then, obviously, above and beyond that, the school board has discretion over allocating funds uh, for particular needs here to be identified. There are restricted dollars that have to be reserved and carried over and spent that way. What we really do look for in any given year is whether or not you can meet that minimum state reserve. Um, be aware, of course, that if Proposition 2 passes in November and certain circumstances play out, that reserve requirement um, does double, but it, Everything above that is considered above and beyond what you're allowed to have. So you would be allowed to have up to six, but no more in, in those circumstances. So the, the whole notion of reserves and your, your ability to utilize reserves as a sort of a, a temporary holding pattern until you can get your structural budget in place as an option at the local level may be effective by proposition two. So that's another thing to bear in mind as you look forward down through the multiple years of the multi-year projection that there may be limited ability to access those reserves that you see on your schedule. So what's the percentage now of our reserves that are available that are restricted reserves to... Yeah, I'm not sure. So so are we going to... It's about 7%. Well, 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 I had a follow-up question for him. Okay. Yeah. It's about, when you look at the unaudited actuals and that 5.2 million, that's roughly about a 7% reserve between the 3% uh, the, the reserve and then the unrestricted and appropriated. Combined is 7%. Combined is about 7%. So that's not very much over the 6% potential on the Proposition 2. And what's the average for the county? Uh, the average reserve level in the county actually is higher than what you're experiencing here at Pamelona, but the districts, the average district in Sonoma County is much smaller. Right. So they really need to carry a higher reserve. Right. reserve. Okay. What about statewide? Statewide um, reserve levels have been in the range of 15 percent. Uh, you're again carrying something on the order of 7 percent, so you're about less than half of the statewide average. I'd be curious to find out what the average is for a similar size district statewide just so because the small districts obviously percentage wise they have to have that cushion. Well just the just the fact that it's been our practice at Helena City Schools is about the average size district in the state. Because okay. if you take our total enrollment of about seventy five <coughs> and multiply it by the thousand um, school districts in the state, that would give you the total ADA in the state. So um, we are that average size district. <laughs> Are there, are there other trends you see that maybe would lead to believe there's some um, fiscal warning signs or something like when I think you said there was like 87.7% were salaries. Is that is there a number there when it creeps up and you see districts get cascading over the top after we reach a certain 
I think Mitch did turn, touch on the, those, the two factors that are probably the greatest challenge for us, and that is the one that the unrestricted um, budget tends to be in that high 80 percentile. Uh, statewide is probably an average number. The, the concern I would share with you is I've been in public schools for, for approaching 30 years, and that's probably 15 percent higher over that period of time. We, we are continually moving up the percentage of unrestricted budgets relative to the dollars that are spent on salaries and benefits. It's just a never-ending kind of trend of growth. So that is a level of concern, and we do monitor that. Um, the other is I'm drawing, oh, the special education report that we presented here tonight. There is an ever-increasing um, fiscal challenge relative to providing the special education services. It's absolutely correct that those are mandated services required by federal law and the environment in which you're providing service and the costs of those services uh, is clearly increasing um, costs over time that far outstrip the funding sources provided. So yes, a, a continually increasing amount of general fund unrestricted dollars are being directed. But that's not unique to Pat Hormon. That's a, I would call it an industry like phenomenon. Well, both of those phenomena are industry related. Yes, we do see both of those happening here. Thank you, Derek. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, questions? I have a quick, I have a quick one. I didn't fill out a paper either. Right. And I'm not the superintendent, I know. But if he can speak without a card, mm -hmm. can I? I just want to share. Last one, right? I, I and be quick. Oh, right. Listen, I have to go. Don't turn this into a pep rally. We're adults. So don't do that. Okay. No. So my please. name is Jeanette I'm with yeah. RC, kindergarten teacher at Grant School. Sure. And I just want to ask you, doctors, if you can even remotely empathize and feel what this whole thing feels like to us. You probably think, what is she talking about? Well, let me just tell you. I Are hope. you talking about the budget? No, no. I'm talking about the feeling okay, so, of hearing. Okay, so, well, no, it no, is no, about no, the no, budget. No, no. It's you know about the budget. We're going to come to the rest oh, of that. No, no. This is the budget. The so give me you budget. know what it feels like to hear that we have a reserve that carries over for reasons of extra salary. It's not, you know, it, it's, it's an extra salary. Um, increase, you know, reserve, whatever you want to call it, for whatever, unexpected employees hired or whatever it is. And to, to hear that it just sits there and rolls over year after year, or 900000 as it was shown, or whatever it is. You know how that feels when we also know, we, we, I mean, do you know how it feels when we really sacrificed 34 years of exemplary teaching, personally speaking, and facilitating 21st century and everything else, to see those 92% graduates and uh, yada, 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 and Jean, that Jenna Teagarden was in my kindergarten, I'm thinking, oh, wow, look at how proud I should be <laughs> to speak. Do you know how that feels when we really feel like the district can do more by seeing that budget that you can actually give us more than take a risk, take, you know, go out on a limb. It's, it's really the time. I can't tell you, and I only have two more years left. By the time I make what I used to make, according to Sturz, I won't be here. I'll never make what I made at one time. And he said, isn't that weird? Were you, you know, did you have a stipend, blah, blah, blah. No, I didn't. And, um, but I just hope that you can go home. That's all I ask. And, and think of it just a little bit. If you can feel how it feels to us out here, who've really, I mean, what other profession does this? For seven years, not even cost of living, and you know, water, water, geez, we pay by the glass now. You know, I mean, five minutes, I know. And I didn't sign. Thank you, Troy. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I speak to the budget for a few minutes? This is the last one period. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Emily Jordan. I'm a research specialist for the California Federation of Teachers. So I work statewide with our local unions, like the Federation of Teachers, on budget issues, on budget analysis. 
and look at these numbers and the situation of districts all over the state. So I just wanted to make a few comments from what I've heard tonight. One is on the reserve issue, and I agree there's a 3% minimum reserve for Petaluma. The reserve has consistently been above that. We all support good budgeting for our schools. We all want our schools to stay fiscally sound. But the fact that the budget's more than double and teachers haven't had a raise, that the reserve is more than double and teachers haven't had a raise in seven years, we think is a big issue. Um, in, in addition, our, the um, official from the county office just mentioned Proposition 2. This, the governor and the legislature have explicitly said that they don't want districts to be holding excess of what their minimum requirement is pending the passage of the rainy day fund. But there's a clear directive that we should all have a minimum reserve, but to keep more than that becomes an issue of holding those dollars at a time when our students and our teachers actually need them to be spent. Because kids only go to second grade once, and if we're holding this money in reserves and not attracting the best quality teachers to teach them, that's an issue. So I just wanted to raise that there's an issue at the state level around this reserve requirement, and that the minimum reserve is being more than met here, and, and we, we could meet that reserve twice over and still have money to give teachers a decent wage. Uh, the other issue is this discussion around one-time money, and I just want to point out that money is not one-time money, it gets put in the reserves. When you have an excess at the end of the year, it gets put in your reserves, and then the reserve money becomes one-time money. But a lot of ongoing funds are commingled in that money along with the restricted dollars. So to think of it as one-time funds is not actually accurate. It only becomes one-time money once it gets put into the reserves, and then it becomes sort of the sacred cow. And this is not an issue unique to Petaluma, but it is an issue that we've seen. And in light of LCFF and the state budget this year, a lot of districts have been giving, using those monies and using the ongoing revenues that are coming in now under LCFF to give decent raises to teachers who haven't seen them in years. So I just wanted to shift the thinking a little bit from this, this red flag of these are one-time funds and we can't spend them, because they're actually not. They only become one time at the end of the year when there's this extra one to two million dollars that Petaluma has consistently had because of sound budgeting, but that's money that is ongoing. It could be spent on, on, on wages and on raises for teachers. And the other piece I just want to echo and then I'll close is this, this question around priorities and projections that folks have raised, because budgeting is about priorities and it's about how you're prioritizing those dollars. And having a big reserve is prioritizing having a big reserve. And again, we support a healthy reserve, but those are priorities. Another priority could be having the minimum requirement or above the minimum requirement reserve, and then having those prioritizing using those additional funds, like the half million that you, that you didn't spend in salary and benefits last year, and putting that towards teacher salary. That's a priority question. And the other thing about projections. How many more other things do you have? This is the last one, as I said, it's my final point. The projections issue, these are all, I did say that I'm going to talk about priorities and projections. Our brother here heard that. The projections issue, these are all projections, the future year projection issues. There, there are always projections. ADA is a projection, revenue is a projection, and at some point we have to make priority, to figure out what our priorities are for the district and make budgeting decisions based on that. And clearly there's funds here to give teachers a healthy rate, so thank you. Thank you. Midge, can you, I'm going to start Midge, can you speak to the, um, the ADA going down and uh, salaries in the allegations? So the, we're not going to have as many uh, teachers and staff, so therefore the number's not. Right. So as I shared earlier, um, you know, this was a very, these, these numbers for enrollment were just received. It takes time to analyze and do the calculations by site level, by grade, to determine whether or not we actually can lay off given the staffing ratios that we have. Um, so that meeting is occurring tomorrow. So we wouldn't have that information you know, until after that. And again, it takes time to go through the budget and then make those adjustments. Um, again, that's why I go back to saying this is a living document. Today we can adjust the revenues because we know that impact. I don't know what the impact yet is on the FTE and the change in staffing at this point. So, you know, I try to deal with knowns. I don't know what that is yet. So, what I do know is that there was a decrease in the enrollment. That's an immediate impact on the one side. What other questions? In the reserves. Explain again the percentage that are restricted and unrestricted and that can go to salary and then this deficit spending trend and whether that 3% reserve, let alone the 6, will be there. Okay, so 
this board has committed reserves to mm -hmm. to the salary proposals. Um, our projection is 2.4, even if you took a million dollars of state um, off of that, uh, 1.4 million. So if you look at that as an ongoing cost, and if you're deficit spending, you're not adding to the reserves. So you know those are one-time funds. If you add to the reserves, and we haven't added to the reserves in in a couple of years, last year this board made the commitment to increase the days back. Even though we even though we didn't have sufficient reserves, dollars, and we knew we deficit spend to do it, we added the days back. We had to go to the reserves to accomplish that, and, and the impact in unaudited actions is 1.4 million. Okay. So the board made the commitment over and above um, the balanced budget. The average reserve in this county is larger. I know um, CSBA recommends 17% reserve. I don't agree with the 70% reserve. I totally agree with what the Federation is saying, that the reserves are being spent. The dollars that we have in reserve are there because we've worked cooperatively with teachers and classified employees during difficult times to build up the reserve. But we've been, we've been spending those reserves down um, over the years. So, so what percentage is it going to be? Let's say they took the 2.5 and the $500 and how much are our reserves percentage-wise? Because we throw a bunch of numbers out there and it gets convoluted. Well, you heard from Midge, it's 7%. If you go to Prop, Prop 2, the maximum reserve level would be 6%. Okay. So we're, you know, really, Prop 2 is, is out there because the average reserve in the state is 15%. It's not because a district has 7% reserve of unappropriated funds. And then as we you haven't used Prop, I mean, we haven't used Fund 17 or any of those other mechanisms that many districts use to hide funds. You know, that's a special reserve where you transfer your, your reserves out there so they don't show up in the general fund. We've always been transparent, and, and all the cuts that we made during the difficult times, those didn't come from here, and they didn't come from here. They came from the budget committee to the board, and the board adopted them. So that was to keep this district solvent in cooperation with our employees. We're honoring our commitment to add the days back two years before we had to. You know, next year you have to be back to um, 185 days. We said, we have the money, teachers, classified. Um, we're gonna give it back to you last year. It's, we know it's more than we have coming in. We're gonna use our reserves. This year, the board made the commitment to um, reduce class size and to provide cost of living increase to employees. And now dollars, you know, one time money in lieu of salary benefit increase straight out of the reserves. It was in the local control funding formula that we're, that we're hearing all about, Petaluma City Schools, both the elementary and the high school district, are losers. Where the average increase in the state's 10%, several districts are getting 20%, we're getting approximately 5%. And that's because of, in the old funding formula, our seventh and eighth graders were treated as high school because they're part of the high school district. And the local control funding formula, seventh and eighth graders get seventh and eighth grade funding. And with that, our high school district would never get back to 0708 levels by 2021, plus COLAs and the deficit makeup, without some economic recovery dollars being added. And the economic recovery dollars being added to the high school district just makes our high school district equal to the biggest losers, losers in the state. Meaning, in 07, in 2021, we will just get back to that level and not enjoy what many districts will receive. Because mm -hmm. um, there's a question about Prop 30 at the last meeting. i tell you where Prop 30 is going, and it's not the Pebble City Schools. It's going to districts that have significant numbers of low socioeconomic students, English language learners, and foster youth. More, you know, average or more. Neither Pelham City Elementary or, or High School District is in that category. So, you know, this board has committed to spending down the reserves. Yes. See, when you think about it, with the reserves, other than trying to maintain 
obviously fiscal solvency and fiscal viability moving forward on projections, which we all know there's a lot of variables and moving parts, especially with the state. Um, other than doing that, we, we don't really have a best interest in stockpiling cash, right? Maybe it's not like we have, and obviously we don't, there's no profit motive, there's no shareholders, there's, it's not like a private enterprise at all. So we're basically just a pass-through entity, correct? We, correct. I mean, when I say pass-through, we pass through to you know, our vendors, our teachers, our, our classifiers, our certifiers, everybody who's making all this work, we, we pass it through and then try to hold some back so that like, a, like almost like a little savings account like a household would have so that you know if you have to dip into it for you know any mm -hmm. unanticipated reason or the state all of a sudden says you know what we said we we're going to give you that but we can't so you don't get it um you could have fluctuations now in your experience have you seen like real sharp spikes that start creeping towards three percent two percent i mean is that is that unrealistic like all of a sudden i, I was just going to the lady's point about six percent three percent and if they make that law so let's just say three percent is the the, the minimum, so you got this six percent the maximum. Yeah, so I'm just saying. So let's say we got this three percent. We'll call it the the, the flow the um, or the cushion. Have you seen situations in your experience? Because I know you have a lot of it, where the state spikes by three percent of what what we get. Well, I mean, you're coming out of the recession where we were being cut 10, 12 percent in a year. But again, working with the bargaining units, you know, we did manage to do that, and so that's why you know the board has made the commitment that we've made but yeah we've seen significant spikes and right now we're on a on a very good track economically in the state um typically good times rarely last more than five years and we're we're there but we're projecting if you look at the out years we're projecting um three four five percent increases in the next couple of years under the local control funding formula so we're projecting that the times are going to remain remain good, but when you look out to um, the future years, even with those projections of state meeting the promise and providing us all the resources, you don't have significant um, surpluses to provide future year increases as well. And so, you know, the worst thing that we can do is to to give an increase now have to take it back um, in future years. I mean, that's... What happens if we dip into those 3% reserves? Well, if, you, if we get into 3% reserves yeah. and we end up less than 3%, that yeah. then, comes this down. Board, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then this board <laughs> does not control... The negotiation process is basically then tempered by the fact that we can agree to something, submit it to the county, and the county can say, no. Um, you don't have adequate reserves. Remember, we have AB 1200 requirements that we have to provide to the county with the CBO and the superintendent's signature that we'll be able to meet after we negotiate the increase our required reserves and provide that calculation to the county. Once you go below the 3%, then you're, then you're looking at the county and the county's going to come in and make sure you're doing what's necessary and required to maintain the minimum reserve level of 3%. And that's, you'd be qualified. We know in Sonoma County that we've had two districts that have been negative. There's only seven in the state, and Tidewater Park and Windsor have been negative. When you're negative, basically, then, you, then this is an advisory board. Negotiations is advisory. And you have a fiscal person who is, who basically, you make a decision, and then you turn to the person and go, is that okay? Um, because you lose your ability to govern. So I hear him saying that he, that SCO's consider, or concern that we're deficit spending. And, we'll get the, and yet we'll it get sounds the like the negotiations, we're talking about what amount of reserves is safe to have without falling down to that 3%. We'll get the nasty letter again um, this year based on the adopted, and we'll be receiving it soon. Just basically warn it's, it's, it's like not a really nasty letter. Not that letter, letter from SMP that it's we're a warning be letter saying you can't continue to, to spend as you're proposing to spend. We just got a letter from SMP with S &P with our rating, right? That said if we continue deficit spend, we'll lose that. Yeah. Um, I know it's not everything. It's just all this it, it's just 
I, I guess I just want the teachers. You know, I see so many of you out there, my children's teachers, who have access to me every day. I don't like to bring the board to you because it's your campus and my children are there. But I'm always wondering why no one says, hey, could you come by after lunch? Or could you come by? Oh, no. 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 Oh, wait a second. Oh, wait, a, wait a second. OK, no, hold on a second. I gave you your opportunity to talk. I have a card. I have a card. OK, hold, hold on a second. But this is my turn. And there are teachers in this room. There are several that I've had conversations with, that I have lunch with, that I meet with as regularly as I possibly. They're in this room. You're sitting behind one of them. I've met with her this year. I've never turned down a meeting, a conversation with a teacher. I've met with Doug Emery. I'm mean, like, I don't want to start doing that, start telling you all the teachers that I've talked to. But to, to say that we're not responsive, I mean, we gave direction to the superintendent at the last board meeting. And we're still waiting to hear from the union. I mean, I'm assuming the direction we gave you, we directed you to return and, and give that offer to the union. Correct. And, 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 and we, we also, you know. No. 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 It was incomplete as I saw it, and we sent it back saying there was one whole thing. Yeah, I, I get it. Okay, we can't stop here. Okay. You can stop here. Okay. Okay. You, the conversation is up here. Okay. Not out there right now. So, what other questions do we have? I, I just, I, do, I guess, I'm just concerned because I, I, it sounds like we're, you know, I'm just worried. I keep hearing all about this deficit spending from outside agencies, not, not just from Steve and Mitch. And so, to me, it doesn't, it, it's, it's worrisome. And so, I just don't want people to think that we're like, eh, you know, I'm taking this extremely serious. I walk on campus with my kids every day. I want their teachers to be happy. Highly paid, highly, highly qualified teachers are what's best for our students. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. So I'm not taking any of this lightly. It's, it's, it's been very, very difficult. Um, so that was just concerning. And I, I just, I, I want people to know that we hear all, all about this, you know, these reserve numbers and this deficit spending and, you know, our audit and our S&P rating and SCO. And so I just don't want anyone to think that we're not concerned and we're not paying a lot of serious attention to this and trying to squeeze out as many dollars as we can. I have seen you not take a lightly, so that makes sense. <laughs> I have one question. So, on the budget. Yeah. So, the million dollars that several people pointed out that we, in theory, didn't spend on some of these. Yep. Where does that million dollars, I mean, I, I've been mm -hmm. into this. Part of, that, part of that is not unrestricted money. Part of that will go back into either Common Core or it'll go into parcel tax or a restricted lottery, which is just only for, well, not, not for salaries and benefits. I take that back. That's instructional materials. But, you know, it could be other things. It could be Title I. It could be other things. It's not just, it's not just the unrestricted side. What I shared with you was the <coughs> overall budget. So you would have to do further analysis. Mm -hmm. But this board, when we were setting parameters, I mean, we established, we, we looked at the million dollar number uh, when we were establishing the parameters and for negotiations. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that wasn't considered and anticipated by this board uh, in establishing parameters. Are there any other questions up here on this unaudited budget presentation? When will we get the audit? December. December. December fifteenth. Is it still is when Roach or whatever? Yeah. Same person. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So this is an action item further down the agenda. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Can we take a two-minute break real quick, and then we're going to bounce on to uh, comments from the public. Yeah. To thank you. Oh. 
I really appreciate everything you've done for the district, for the sport, and educating me, which has been pretty tough for you, I appreciate it. <laughs> Somebody who's been in banking for 25 years, this is the most counterintuitive thing I've ever seen ever. And, uh, and I appreciate that, but uh, we're really going to miss you. Uh, the feeling is very mutual. This is a, a very tough decision, I have to say, because this is my home. This is where my boys grew up. This is where I watched them grow up in this environment. And um, this is truly what I feel is the best district in this county. Um, I think that we do things for all the right reasons. We do it for kids. And I really believe that we, um, this board has done everything to support everything that happens out in, to make kids successful. Well, and this um, is about you, not us. Well, no, I know, but it's, see, it's easier to talk about you guys. <laughs> anyway, you. I, I, I wish you the best of luck. This is, thank you so much, and it's a great place, and I, I'm going to miss you. But you know what? I'm a resident here. Exactly. <laughs> I second that. You, you've done a great job, and you've kept your cool, and you've um, I'm not here tonight. I think everybody's pretty respectful of the questions, but I've seen you be peppered before, and sometimes I know we've asked uh, awkward, difficult questions, but you know your little uh, emojis and prompts, and I know budgets and numbers can be just as dry as a glass of sawdust. So you do a good job of making it as digestible. Because I'll echo Troy's sentiments. I deal with a lot of businesses out there. If if, if this was a budget that someone brought to you at a bank, they'd run you right out. They'd never give you a loan. That's all I'm telling you. So. Um, you've done a good job of navigating that morass, whatever it is. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. All right, so we're going to move to public comment. And uh, I have, I think, properly sorted these. But I just want to make sure. Now, I'm talking strictly negotiations. I've got Sandra Larson, Doug Emery, Brent and K. Yule. And K. I put K. Slash K. So they're both K. Tara. Okay. Tara. Okay. Do you want to come up separately on Twitter? I'm awful generous tonight. I don't have anything going on. Nobody's at home. I can get home at 10 or 11 o'clock. But we want to give you your time. Do you want to come up separately, Doug? Okay, so we're going to go. Good. That actually works out better for me. Uh, we're going to go Brent Newell. And make sure everybody's still here, too. Uh, Jenny, and I'm sorry, Jenny. Rachel. No. Labakis. How do you say it? Labakis. Thank you. Labakis. Yeah, the Okay. Uh, Brenda, uh, Martin, and Gina. Right? Gina. Oh, is it? Excuse me. I called you Gina earlier. I apologize. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, we're going to do the same thing we did before and we're going to round up. We're going to go four minutes. I'm going to go a little different this time because I need you to respect my four minutes. Three and a half minutes, I'm going to give an awkward wave, okay? So can you wrap up after an awkward wave in 30 seconds? Is that fair? Is everybody okay with that? Okay. All right. And uh, Jeannie, since you said you had somebody to come pick up or do something, would oh, you? Oh, someone else already picked him up, so it's okay. Well, you don't want to go first? No. Well, I'll go first, but I don't want to go first for that reason, because I'm not going to tip it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, well, I just want to say that I'll accept your activity. We have somebody who needs to go home. Who needs to go home? Okay. So, if you introduce yourself. Sure. I'm uh, Brenda Martin, and I'm a parent of children here in Helena City Schools. Um, first, I'd like to thank all the board members for representing our community, providing leadership, oversight and ensuring accountability on our behalf in these important positions with the school board. I realize your job at times may not be easy to have to deal with budgets, policies, and I can see how it can be a bit overwhelming. I imagine about, among many things, your job requires the ability to listen to the community while upholding integrity and at the same time keeping the welfare of our children in mind. One lesson I learned from a mentor of mine is all that any individual in life wants, is not what and any individual in life wants is to be heard. Do you see me? Do you hear me? And does what I see matter? Because I have children within the school district and I myself have been on PTA and PTSA boards, I consider myself an advocate for both my children and their teachers. The pa parents that have had to leave but were represented here, and there are many more that couldn't be here tonight in person, 
um, would like to just see open negotiations happen between the school board and the district teachers of this district. Our hope is that the immediate issues at hand can be addressed and that is that teachers have a fair opportunity to discuss them. And having this chance, perhaps a more productive roundtable discussion can happen and resolution can be found. This is very important to me as a parent. We parents of the school district have the perception that the matters at hand have become more of a school board and superintendent versus the teachers of our district. This cannot be in the best interest of the district or the children, wouldn't you agree? I've always considered education to be the foundation of a child's future, especially my children. Teachers are obviously instrumental in any program's effectiveness. For me personally, I know there have been a couple of amazing teachers in the school district who have left a mark in my children's minds and hearts. This is what being a teacher is all about, making a difference in children's lives and helping them move on to the next step in life with confidence. This is the kind of investment and effort I want from our teachers for my children. Wouldn't it be better for our kids to get our teachers focused on their job of teaching instead of worrying about all the other stuff that keeps them distracted? I just want to thank you for your time and hope that you will consider our, their, our concerns as well and we'll work towards a resolution as soon as possible. Thank you. You know, that's, right that's interesting because the last time we met, you said you knew my family name, even in my speech. Hello, my name is Jenny Labacus. My name is Jenny Labacus. I have been a Petaluma City School teacher for over 16 years. I have taught fifth and sixth grade for nine years and one year at McKinley Elementary. For five years, I worked home hospital under Petaluma City Schools, and I'm in my third year of kindergarten at, Pet at Pengrove Elementary. Pengrove, by the way, with our declining enrollment, I guess we lost 25 students. I will point out that we have lots of students that attend the GATE program. So once they hit fourth grade, they do stay, still stay in our district. They also go to the sixth grade academy. And I really hope, according to those numbers, that Pengrove doesn't lose an amazing teacher because we just hired an amazing kindergarten teacher. So to go on, um, I want to say that um, as I worked at Pengrove Elementary, I have a deep respect for my principal. And I also love my school. Why do I love my school? Because my twins attend Pangrove Elementary. They are first graders. I have never addressed this board in this capacity, so please do not look upon me as an instigator. Only recently have I taken a more active role as a union rep for my site because we did not have one for a few years. At the last board election, I didn't vote for you guys because I lived in Katati. But now I am a Pangrove resident and I can't say that I feel 100% confident on the choices that you guys are making in the best interest of my children and the best interest of the teachers. And I'm including classified on this one as well because I was amazed on the things that I heard at the last board meeting. As a parent, teacher, dedicated community member of Pet Petaluma for over 25 years, I'm also a Petaluma High School graduate, I have not seen how you make our schools better, especially with the recent events that have unfolded during our union negotiations. So Steve, I approached you earlier. Did you get a raise after we accepted the furlough seven years ago? Only a new job. A new job title. So you got a new job title? Yes. OK, so I got to say that kind of hurts because it felt like, OK, well, we just gave up a lot. Mm -hmm. And then when your salary increased and ours decreased, it really hurt. And it doesn't send a good message. So I sat in this room when the decision was made, handed down to increase our kindergarten day by 88 minutes. We went from 11.40 to 1.40 without any teacher input or shared decision making. Sherry, you told the audience that we were welcome to come talk to you and share our concerns or any questions. So I relate to you. When I first started as a teacher, as a fifth, sixth grade combo, I had an assistant for three hours. When I was at McKinley, I had an assistant for an hour and a half who also did yard duty. I invited you to come to Pengrove and see how I taught 25 students without an assistant, without a reliable parent volunteer on my own. And I gotta tell you, Sherry, I didn't, have, I, I, I didn't see it. We had a couple emails go back and forth, and I have proof of those emails, and they were very nice emails to each other. 
but I have never seen you at my school. We came by Pembroke and we came in the afternoon and invited all of staff to come and be with us. Did you ever send me an email? We were communicating by email. I never received that email. Sure. So I know life is busy. I myself, I work 50%. I'm a job share. I love my job share. I volunteer two days a week as a parent at Pengrove Elementary. My husband works 60 plus, plus hours a week at pg &E. He is a first responder lineman. He helped with the earthquake situation in Africa. I am a very active member of my PTA. I help with the mileage club, planting panthers, garden club, library. I am a grant writer, computer lab, and I organize family fun nights. So I get it. Life gets busy. But are we a priority for you? Do you realize that if I didn't have my husband, my children would be on free and reduced lunch? So I got the roundup. I feel the PCS board has failed me as a teacher, a parent, as a community member. I understand that voting is a personal decision. There are many Pengrove families that want our opinions. We are your constituents. Would you please not ignore us and our please? Thank you very much. Um, I want to bring up the last speaker we had, I think his name was Mr. Serrata, who told us that he just happened to come to this meeting or was, came because he needed to tell you something. But when I asked him on the way out if he was invited, he said yes. So I don't really feel like he was here because he needed to be here. He was here to make someone's point. And he spoke and he went way beyond five minutes. And you guys listened to him intently and asked questions. And we had someone from our union come to offer you some their input on the budget. And you kind of cut her off. And I didn't hear one question. And as I watched you all, it really looked like it was going in one ear and out the other. So I'm going to ask you to please take into consideration the information that is coming to you from all sides. There are experts from all sides that can have all different opinions about budgets. And I, I think you really need to take that all into account. And on a completely different note, I want to go back to the presentation at the very beginning about um, that, I don't even have the acronym anymore, about the new funding form that we have and, and the public engagement or the parent engagement. That very, very important piece. I have huge concerns about how that happened in the past. And I need to know that you guys are aware of it um, because I think it could be something that could cause some issues with um, if, if anybody found out about it. But it, we are supposed to have parent involvement in that, parent engagement. We had a flyer at our school that was at the back of a bunch of other baseball and soccer and football and boys and girls club flyers. And one of our teachers found it and said, wow, this is really important. We need parents to see this. We Xeroxed it sent it out, and we're told, oh, we really don't want that many parents at that meeting. And that really concerns me. There were some schools, pardon me? Who specifically told that? Uh, I believe it was my principal. Okay? And I believe it was coming down from someone in the district. Other schools sent them out. So I ha at that meeting, I believe there were seven parents that attended, and um, who were just parents and not teachers. It was mostly teachers that were there. And I really don't feel like we can honestly say that we had parent involvement and parent input on that very important document and plan. Kind of a hostile environment right now. I, I do, and I and I really, I really don't want to feel that way. But I do feel that this is a hostility, and there's there's a real divisiveness, and there's just a real tension here. And I, I really don't, um, I don't like really addressing people under tension. And I really hope, I seriously hope there's no retribution because it has happened in the past. And I, 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 I these are really really well-meaning people. Let, let me speak to that for just a second. Thank but you. I will start this is a tense situation. I don't think there's tension up here. I think that this is 
a tense situation. I just heard a lot of tension, Troy. Yeah, I, I, I just heard it calling out. And I, I, don't, I think it's just I'm a sorry. tense situation. And I think it is. That there, there's, there's clearly uh, differences of opinions and, and differences of vision, if you will. But um, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling a hostility. I'm feeling a hostility. I just don't. Can I ask a point of clarification and order? Is, is this public comment right now? Yeah. Okay. It, and is just a clarification during public com comment? Isn't it just the public making the comments and then you are listening? Isn't that what it's supposed to be? I'm just asking. Well, what are you asking? Well, I'm asking that. I mean, are, are you asking me there, that? There's, there's, there's several, there's been several um, people who have come up during. I'm just wanting to make sure I'm getting the procedure correct here. So I, I'm just asking that during public comment, I, I was under the impression, maybe mistakenly, that it was just our time to present to you and there was no back and forth. I, I'm just wondering. Yeah. Hadn't started the clock, was concerned about Doug's concern that there's tension out, okay. and I'm trying to defuse it. So okay. if I yeah. skated out of what I would normally do, I skated out of what I would normally do. When I'm having a dialogue about a specific issue, we're certainly not negotiating. I just want to make sure that you feel comfortable in your formats telling us what it is that you like. Thank you. I feel more comfortable. Thank you, Troy. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ken. I'm going to start. Thank you. Um, um, my name is Doug Emery. I've been a teacher in the district for, I don't know, 28 years, 29 years. Uh, you know, uh, I started at Kinley, worked there for a while, but uh, there was retribution. We were moved, five of us were disseminated to other, um, other schools for raising our hands and saying, you know, I don't think kids should really be taught this way. And uh, we were right. And soon the, the, the population disappeared and they needed to bring in a charter school. And that's another whole story. But uh, it, it has happened in the past, and I, I really resent that have ever having happened. The principal has retired since then. But Steve was there. He was uh, under Greta, and uh, he was aware, very aware of things. Uh, you know, I was also a teacher of the year. We have a couple, maybe one or two teachers of the year here in the unit. So I'm not just talking off the top of my head. I've seen things happen here, and I've seen really good things happen. I've been really proud of this district for the most part. But uh, tonight I was proud when, when, uh, when Dave Rose spoke and he showed us all these things going down, the, the most important pieces. And some kids were EL kids and, and uh, EOs, as they say, oh, uh, English only, as these suspension rates and, these, and, and, and actually our, our graduation rates were going up. And he acknowledged that teachers and counselors, I hope you heard that, that teachers and counselors, not the administration, he didn't take pride in that. He didn't take the self-pride, he was humble. He gave it to us. And this is it. And it's starting in kindergarten, our teachers who have been abused. I'm, I'm, frankly, they have been abused. There's no time to pee. They can't even pee. They have no aids. They have, they have a class full of kids, 25 kids, without aids. It's unheard of. Uh, if, this, if this is the 21st century, if this is the 21st century, and we are getting 21st century furniture now, it has wheels on it. <laughs> it has wheels. The tables have wheels. Now that is 20. This is what we're expending it on, and we're getting it whether we want it or not. It just got it's getting sent to us. It got ordered. So this is 21st century, 21st century technology, but we're not thinking about young kids. His statistics were 14 years ago. There was no 21st century stuff around. We had chalkboards. We were proud of it. We used chalk, colored chalk. And that's where those kids came from. Those graduation rates came from 14 years ago. How many people were here in the district 14 years ago? Anybody? Well, yeah. These people without 21st century. And those people have all gone off to Duke, Stanford, I mean, you could just name it off. I mean, I, I, there's probably a great list of people. That was before we made all this expenditure on all this crap. I mean, those Google books, all those things that she was talking about, Jane, earlier, that is, we haven't had the internet on since. We started. <laughs> <laughs> we have not had the internet. The, the funding came from the public. I, I, there are two worlds going on. The one you heard about and the one we know. It's true. These people know. This is the greatest deception I have ever seen. The greatest, the LCAP, I have never seen a more pub, poorly public showing. Even on the McDowell uh, marquee, it wasn't even stated there. There was no place to find out. I went and I sat there and I never, I sat in these little groups that went around really fast. We barely had time to say, 
We had a lot to say, but it didn't get recorded. It just didn't happen. So I understand. So if you're going to fund all these 21st centuries, please remember, remember, and know in your hearts that I want you to invest in the hands down greatest entity. It's the greatest proven learning entity. It's the teacher and the worker that works directly with kids. That's what it's all about. That's what you value. You don't give your management top management the highest raise first. You didn't have to do that. You could have given us all at the same time. You gave the top, the just bank. like you see in the banks. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I hope that <laughs> you invest in Petaluma City Schools, invest in the low risk, highest yield, clean, smarter, and Brandy socially Brandy responsible Brandy. teachers, and that is rude. I'm yeah. frankly, that is rude. Yeah, I asked you ahead of time. So, so no, that is rude, Troy. Brentwood. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board. I'd like to thank you for your service uh, on the board and taking on this very, very important issue of the, the teacher's contract and their compensation. Um, I'm a parent of two kids, one's at uh, McNear and the others at Petaluma Junior High. And frankly, they wouldn't be doing as well as they are doing if it wasn't for the great teachers that are going above and beyond to give them a good educational experience. Really, I mean, these are teachers who are working, you know, they come in before the school year starts, they get their classrooms ready, they're not getting paid for those days. They're working late, they're working on the weekends to prepare for classes, they don't have enough prep time during the day to do their job. And I'm concerned because of the lack of transparency and what appears to be good faith negotiating tactics. I know about negotiating tactics. I'm a public interest environmental litigator. Uh, I can I come and appear before boards like you, state agencies, suit entities like you before. Um, and I'm really concerned about what I saw in this board meeting tonight because there's a very concentrated discussion on finances and on the bottom line and on money. And that's all well and good. That's well and good. I'm concerned about what appeared to be an orchestrated appearance by the, the deputy superintendent to add to that discussion and that concern. What I'm not hearing from you and what really bothers me is a concern about the most important asset in your district, your teachers, and your concern about their performance, their morale, and the quality of education that they provide. They took, they're operating on a 2007 salary level right now. They took a pay cut, they got it back, right? And you're offering them a 2.5% increase over that 2007 salary level? That's seven years have gone by since then. Each year, the average inflation rate has been about 2%. The money that they're earning is losing its purchasing power every year. That $2,007, in order to buy what that dollar bought then, you would need $1.14 now. The cost of living in this town is going up, and your contract offer is not respecting them, and the tone that's going on in this meeting as a parent it's, this is not a good thing to do with your most important asset. You need to come back to the table, negotiate transparently, in good faith, and bring something more to the table. You've got this giant nest egg. Pay them more. They've earned it. Thank you very much.
Thank you. So I'm going to cut to my, I have two requests for the board tonight. The first one is being that I would love to meet with each and every one of you privately. I've been told not directly by you, but by other people that you have found it um, inappropriate to talk to me. Um, the fact that you're getting all of your information behind closed doors from Mr. Bowman is troubling to say the least. I am asking the board to talk to teachers. Even if you feel you cannot talk to me, which I don't understand why that would be, and talk to other members of the community. I'm asking this board to independently look at the unaudited actuals and the projected budgets from earlier this year. Before you tell members of the community that there is no money, COLA, we can't even call it a race, that you feel teachers and classified so richly deserve. Second, I want to publicly address the comments the superintendent wrote in an ill-advised memo that was sent to every employee of Petaluma City School District on August 25th. In section two, titled Union Strength, Mr. Bowman stated he had strong evidence that an alleged statement made at a budget committee meeting was not true. First, I never stated that the comment came from the budget committee. That was an assumption on Mr. Bowman's part. But I do have my agenda, and I do have the very place I wrote the comment with an exclamation mark when it was said. He went on to state that this is not the first time he'd heard this allegation. He followed it up with other people at the meeting and decided it was not true. Did he use hearsay, secondhand information to reach this conclusion? Were his conversations taped or were there careful notes taken when he was asking these people? At no time did the superintendent contact me to ask me about the statement. Are we to believe that he heard a statement earlier, investigated it without talking to the person who made the statement, found it not to be true, but did not say anything until I brought it up to this board? What kind of leader conducts an investigation without talking to all parties? Why would any superintendent openly try to da damage a teacher's reputation without the courtesy of a personal meeting? Here is the exact statement that I wrote down. Other districts have strong unions. You can send it off to the crime lab and have the ink tested if you would like. My word is my bond and my integrity is extremely important to me. Character assassination is a line that should not be crossed and it must not be crossed if we are truly to negotiate in good faith. In conclusion, I'm asking this board to direct their representative to return to the negotiation table. The memo sent to all of us on August 25th is the best argument for having our members quietly observe the process. We are not asking for third party represent representatives. We are asking that our members, Petaluma City School teachers, have the right to witness the negotiations. There is precedent, and now there clearly we see there is need. My boss has sent a memo out to every person that works for this district and told them that I am either lying or incompetent. I wait for a retraction. Thank you. teacher for 28, uh, 28 years, uh, proudly, until the last few years, it's been a little questionable. Now, on kindergarten, um, to be civil with young children, and to be focused on young children, young children, very young children, four and five year old, years old, you take care of their needs. You don't just pack them in like you would rats. And let's watch which one starts to spin and chew on the other one's tail. <laughs> and that's what we've got going here. Yeah. There's kids coming into school, they pee and they poop and they pee. Yeah, and there's one teacher in there for all those extra 80 minutes, for God knows why it's an extra 80 minutes, but there it is without any help. And the schools that are most impacted are the schools that have those kids that are less developed. Kids that are coming in less developed, they didn't go to a TK. They don't speak English, or they just are, they're just newly transitioned, or they've gone through some kind of 
divorce or a situation that gets them spinning anyway. They're coming in emotionally needy. For some reason, teachers know this, the new kindergarten kids that are coming in are much more emotionally needed, needed, needy than ever before. And we're wondering what in the world it is. They're not given the iPads right away. It's just something else that's going on. So, but what do we do with it? Well, you haven't done anything with it. You just sort of experimented with it. I want to know after the first year, where was your evaluation? After doing this extra 80 minutes last year, where's the evaluation of whether you got better output? Did you get any output? Did, what, what did you find out? Did, what, were the kids okay? Were the parents okay with it? There was no evaluation done. And yet you added these minutes, you put a teacher in there as a grand experiment of the 21st century. Holy mech. You had Rudolf Steiner spin in his grave, Maria Montessori. I mean, I felt the shake. Did you feel it the other night? It was like, <laughs> there is something going on here. What in the world? We have a, we have a curriculum person who's a kindergarten teacher. Now, what in the world, what notion is that that you add a longer day to kids so they get more tired, they get more stressed, it's not healthy. And anybody will tell you that. It's not, the cortisol levels must be off the chart. There's got to be, I mean, you could do that testing, do that assessment, find out what the cortisol levels are and how you're driving diabetes. I don't know what it is, but you need to assess this because it's not working. And we need to have help and aids in there. There are schools that don't have English speakers who cannot be aids in, in, in English, uh, an English speaking environment in, in a way that is helpful and useful. They, they want to help, they want to help in the gardens and so on, but we need help in those kindergartens. And they need a time when they can have a break and not have to have a kindergarten guard outside the door while they go into a kindergarten toilet and they go to the restroom <laughs> to try to get some privacy because that's what's going on. And that is atrocious in the 21st century. And I blame, I do blame you. And I, I just don't understand why you don't go to these schools and see it for yourself and realize, holy mackerel. They're ashamed because they want to do the best. Teachers want to do the best thing. We always want to do the best. I cried when my third graders went there for their first buddies. I cried. I told Andrea, my buddy, my buddy, my kindergarten buddy, I said, I cry, I'm crying. I, I, it's a good cry. It's a good cry, Andrea, because these little girls and boys were just hugging each other so tight and shaking and smiling. They couldn't let go, and the boys were all standing there like this, like taking them by the hand, embarrassed as all get out. But there was just such love in that room. But I was there to help, and I was so glad I was. But when I left, holy mackerel, it's a tough one. Last year was awful. And now that class has gone through and it's now driving other teachers. You know, so we are not doing a service. So in 13 years, <laughs> you're going to see a different statistic up there. Because what we have done is we have not deficit spending. We have given a deficit to those kindergartners and those kindergarten parents. And that deficit, you don't get back. You can't get back. And I, I know my time's probably up. You're looking at that clock pretty fast, but I, I just feel I just feel like uh, you have really let down this district. You've let down the kindergarten families and the teachers in the last two years. And we need somebody that knows how to deal with young children and give them their best. We need help there. So please, that's my kindergarten statement. Please help our teachers. Please help the children. Do what you're here. You're a trustee. You're trusted to do these things to help give worth to these people. All of us. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry, did we say Christa O'Connor? Thank you. Our last one is Kim. Good evening, I'm Kim Sharp. Um, I am a parent in the district. I teach at Costa Grande High School and I'm also the president of the Petaluma Federation of Teachers. You all know that, but I know I need to say that before I get started. Um, unfortunately, I'm not here to speak tonight about anything um, really happy, um, but I am here to speak tonight about the level three grievance that PFT has filed um, against the superintendent on Monday, September 8th. Um, PFT was truly shocked and disappointed that Mr. Bullman felt he needed to prevent our members from conducting union business before and after school last Friday, September 5th. 
His email to administrators, which was forwarded to my members, was inappropriate and truly detrimental. I'm deeply saddened and disappointed that the district's administration's treatment of the Federation has reached such a low point. Not only have we filed the grievance, but we are also amending our current unfair labor practice charges to include this questionable and illegal action, as it is a clear violation of our contract, the EERA, plus our state and federal constitutional rights. <coughs> the Educational Employment Relations Act, which is EERA, is very clear about an employer's parameters when union activities are happening. Section 3543.5, states, and I'll read the short section to you, um, EERA makes it unlawful for an employer to, one, interfere with the exercise of rights conferred by the act on employees or their unions, two, refuse to meet and negotiate in good faith, which expressly includes knowingly furnishing an, ex an exclusive representative with inaccurate information regarding the financial resources of the public school employer, Three, interfere with, dominate, or discriminate among employee organizations. Or four, refuse to participate in the impasse procedures in good faith, which is the full section. The Federation asked the board to please support all certificated employees and classified employees by preventing the district administration's engagement in discrimination and unilateral damaging actions against us. We are professionals and expect to be treated as such. Members of the board, please respect and support our teachers who ultimately support our students. Thank you. Thank you. One last piece, if you are interested, I have copies of the grievance that was filed and what it was filed from. So if you're interested, I can provide that for you. We can pursue that today. Thank you. All right, I am going to again put the smell at 9 o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and call another minute or two minute break. Right. We're back. Moving on to item I, report and activity of correspondence of school board members. We've got uh, back to school nights. Uh, meeting with PFT reps. Art Dosa meeting of Dow Common Core meeting with Jane, a community member, attending varsity soccer games, and the PEF Bash. Which, anybody hear numbers on that? Yeah, the numbers are up. Uh, very good. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a very good evening. It was their highest year yep. in the last five years. I got the little uh, alert from Chase that they hit my credit card yesterday morning, yeah. so there you go. <laughs> That's good. So that was a, a nice time. Yes. And it was very well attended by them. So well done, she chose. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Nice to see. Okay, let's go to the consent agenda. Um, we did not move anything off of it, so yep. I'll keep it. So moved. Second. All those in favor of the consent agenda. Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Done. Uh, uh, services. Just working my way down here. So on items 12 and 13, purchase orders and list of expenditures, do we have anybody that needs to uh, sit down? Call it please. On which one? On both. On both. I'm fine. You're fine on both. I like motion. Aye, so let's go on item 12, purchase orders. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? With one abstention. Is that the right word for that? It is abstention, I believe. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And those are That's a That's more of a legal term. It's a abstain. Abstain. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then item 13, list of expenditures. So moved. Second. Any Second. questions, concerns? I, I just have a question generally. Why is something, sometimes it's a purchase order and sometimes an expenditure? Troxel yeah. communication sometimes shows up on both lists. Okay, because um, we've made, we purchased the item and we're expending and we're asking you to ratify the mm -hmm. purchase of it. Yep. Got a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Was that an aye over there? Oh, well, he right. was refused. I said aye. Oh, I heard and, something. And they were doing something back here. Something back here. Item 14, the revised memorandum of understanding authorization with Gateway to College Academy Charter School. I'll take a motion. So. I'll take a second on that. Second. Who wants to speak to that? Is that going to be? Yeah. Which one is that? 
the gateway to call the Charter School. Mitchell did that. Yeah. Um, Does it clear that? No, um, it's still um, it's still at the state level. Um, we revised the document. The charter document was revised to reflect the incorporation of the waivers that have been submitted to the state superintendent's office. Um, we thought that it would be prudent to do that to show that the, the board is aware of how the, the um, charter is operating and to be transparent and clear about that. Um, so, yeah, the waivers are still in a pending status. We are waiting for further information on the next steps. Oh, Here, go ahead. Before I forget, it's a housekeeping thing. When there's a document with 52 pages and there's like a few pages with changes, if there's a way in the notes to identify the pages with the changes um, so that I'm not scanning every single okay. 52. I mean, just yeah. technically. Okay. Just to make it easier because it's one thing to go through. So you want to see the edited paper. version as opposed to I, the edited edit, version? I, the edited version, it had lines out and stuff. So I found the, the changes, which was great. But if they could be identified in the Oh, in the like C page in three. Oh, C page three. Yeah, three. yeah, just the places that are oh, tracked. Like a summary? No, no, no. no. Well, in the no. Re board recap, yeah. stay on the board recap the pages yeah. that have been edited so that they can So that we can just go pages. to those pages quickly because so, it's just hard to do. In your new job, go do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mitch isn't taking any notes. I'm not as good as 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 That's not a directive, it's a suggestion for the new job. Thank you. I will take that on your advice. Thank you. Everybody okay? Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, item 15, uh, agreement authorization for, Car is it Carlisle? Carlisle Macy, yep. Carlisle Macy Civil Engineering, uh, landscape architecture for all weather track and syn synthetic turf, football, soccer, lacrosse field at Costa Grande High School. So, so this is one of the board promises in the bonds and um, what we indicated would be one of our first projects. So the expectation is the day after that they'll put together a plan and you will bring back a bid, authorization will go to bid later uh, this fall, probably winter. Be out to bid first, right after the first of the year with the plan that the day after graduation, they will hit this field and have it ready for like the second or third week of football season. And the football coach is aware of that and working on next year's schedule to um, schedule away at the beginning of the year. Well, Costco has got an affirm that they can, they've got a- They practice on the field. Too. They don't practice on the field, okay. it's just two, game. Two questions, have we worked with uh, Carla and Macy before? Carla and Macy, um, we have used them for other projects and they've done a no number of the synthetic fields in the area. Okay, the second thing is, once this gets built, we're not gonna take those Track kids, six thousand bucks. We're going to keep it in there for something else and use so it for regards, athletic boosters or something. So we've already had this conversation with the athletic um, boosters, and so we're going to do the field. They're going to take those dollars and do the hurdles and all the equipment. Okay. Good. So not only will they have new field, they'll have new equipment to go with their new field. All right. Because right. those little boys. And they're were, still doing the bricks. They were working. And, they're still they're working. and the bricks are being incorporated yes. into this plan. All right. Very good. Okay. Plan. And then I just have a question, would we also use this company, would we benefit from having them bid on the Federal High project at the same time, or does this only cover projects we're doing on there? One project at it, so the next year we turn around and do Federal High, and based on the performance of them on this project, we would foresee entering into an agreement for them to do the Federal High project. We're entering into this agreement based on the projects that they have done uh, in the area. Basically they're a project manager. No. They're the engineering design engineers. But they they bid out the construction piece of it. Correct. They well in reality the next item where Katroki Kwok the architects will be bidding out the items. They will oversee their aspect and the construction of theirs. And then the architect is doing ADA DSA um, restrooms mm -hmm. and and the booth. press box. And what's the, what's the difference between bidding out construction projects and then when you're using professionals, um, not, not necessarily consultants, but like engineers and stuff. So what's so, the process on that? So we've, we could have had all of this under the architect, but we agreed to separate the two contracts so we're not paying the markup on Carlisle Macy who was doing just the track, which was not going to require DSA approval. There's more projects. so. Um, we'll have DSA approval for this now, 
and you need the architect who takes it and gets it signed off through DSA. So you're saving money this way. We're saving um, money. So we're not paying the markup on, on the engineering aspect. Okay. All right. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, item 16, sort of like partner this to. Why do you do this? I can't get a new architect. <laughs> Quattro Key Squad. Quattro Key Squad. How many years Quattro Key Squad? QKA, just QKA. QKA. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Pension design services for replacement of track fields and employee services and facilities cost for national safety. So, give me a motion. Second. Somewhere over here. Second. All right, and does anybody need any more discussion? No, I understand Everybody that. Everybody okay? Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That goes. Uh, Ward of bid 0414, modular building for Penn Grove Elementary School YMCA to American Modular Systems Inc. in the amount of $378,600 to the elementary capital facility fund. The superintendent being authorized to approve change orders up to 10%, except the work is being complete. I'm going to start so, on this side. So moved. Okay. Sorry. They didn't jump, so I I'll second. I'll second. Sorry. Who, who gets this one? I, I'll, I'll speak to you. Just, um, so Pingrove Elementary School, the old admin building classroom, um, when you walk onto the campus from the staff parking lot, is in desperate need of replacement. So um, I need this. We're going to um, replace <coughs> this facility using um, capital facilities funds. So again, restricted funds that can only be used for um, facilities and this is just the building itself okay. down far that you're going to see yeah. the um, the site work going out to bid for the site work which will be additional funds to um, complete this project and it's not an inexpensive site to to do construction on so we're expecting that to be a very significant amount um, but we're just going authorization to go to bid for that the reason we bid the facility first it's obviously lead time to construct the facility once the site work is done. And it's for the, to house the YMCA? Well, we'll have YMCA and other programs in, in offices around them. Other oh, school but, district programs? Yeah, and the YMCA is our child care program. Right. And so, you know, we have the Y providing the program as we do at Grant and, and McNear. Mm -hmm. is, is that going to involve a teardown or removal of anything that's already there? That's, that's included in the cost. site work? They okay. did the demo of the existing. Okay. Um, plus. Kind of like we did over, I think it was McKinley, right? That's mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. What fund does this come out of? Um, developer fees. It's out of our capital facilities funds. Or it can be used on buildings. Correct. Okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> a lot of money. Yeah. 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 Hey, Pete, what do you see what it costs just to tear one of those things down? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you'll see that in the, as part of the um, bid 0614. And then what's the longevity of these buildings in the last um, The building that's there is probably 40 years old. Um, so in reality, under the state, you can you modernize portables after 20. And so you, you'll modernize it after 20 and probably replace it after 40. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, item 18, bid authorization 0514, Costco County High School Phase 2 Special Ed Modular Building site work. So, second. Um, this is the permanent building um, that's going to be installed in for fifteen sixteen. Um, this year we installed the temporary portable, and uh, so this would be replacing it permanently. Um, and this is just oh, this is for the site work, not just not the building is was to early. go out to bid. To go out to bid on for the site work. Bid authorization. Okay. okay. So, at the last meeting, the board approved the purchase right. uh, thing, yeah. of the portable. This mm -hmm. is the site, the site work, site. Okay. and okay. it's okay. not a single classroom. It's two classrooms. So we'll return two lease modulars. What's your guess on the bid? Come on, give me a guess. <laughs> it's going to. <laughs> it's going to be sixty, isn't it? It's going to be at least sixty for site work. For site work, bringing electrical. Alarms. I think the McKinley one was 67, so I'm going to guess 73. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be exceeding 60. <laughs> I think Mike's going to be on this one. Yeah. And this is all. This is for two classrooms, too, as opposed to one. So Mike, more. Okay. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed. 
I can't wait to see that bid. Item 19, okay. bid 0614, the elementary school of Pengrove, with the modular building site work, which you've already told us is going to be mm -hmm. expensive. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, item 20, uh, bid 0714, the Paloma High School bleachers and gym floor replacement, phase two. So moved. Second. So we did, we did the floor. And when we got DSA approval, it was for floor and bleachers. So this is the second phase. Significant lead time. So this is to uh, authorization to go to bid now. We'll open the bid soon, and they will start constructing the bleachers to fit the site and install right after um, basketball season. Hmm. So uh, the facility be out of commission. Just in time. The end of basketball season. Yeah. To until the next. Steve, you're supposed to do it before. I know. Or a year late. Or a year late. But last year we last year we didn't have the bonds to do this part. That's why we spaced. Is this also going to do the uh, the entryway and yes. the doors and that whole thing? Yes. Adding eight additional doors to meet because when you start touching turns into like a lobby-ish kind yes. of thing. Okay. It's part of a major renovation. It's a major right? renovation. It's it's bonds, the side, the side, all bonds, bond, all bond. Yeah. Steve, all bonds. I had a quick question. Though. Did we get? The, um, the do we resolve there is a floor issue from phase one? So, yeah, the resolve to that is the company is going to come back and refinish and restripe at the conclusion of this project because when you're putting bleachers in, guess what? It's going to need to be refinished. And so that was, so they're supposed to fix the striping issues and the and the floor issues. Is there any kind of bonding that we can get to make sure they don't go out of business between now and then or any kind of assurance to? Um, on her flooring, that's not a that's not a significant portion of the cost. But okay. all we have right now is we have the quote for doing the work because I wouldn't we did. Midge was very steadfast in not releasing the funds until we agreed we had a reasonable price for and part of the work. And part of it they're doing free, and part of it we're, the refinishing we're paying for. The restriping they're doing free because of the issues with the existing striping. So again, is there an overall plan for that gym rather than doing it piecemeal? Yeah, this is this is completes the, the final, project. This is the final, this is the final, final for that and finishes the gym. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Oh, the 2013-2014 unaudited actuals approval for the 2013 unaudited actuals and revised budget for all funds. So moved. Second. Okay. Any further discussion after? That. She just has to come back for the audit deductibles in December. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Guest appearance. We'll need a bond from you too, Mitch. <laughs> okay. All those in favor? No problem. Bye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, resolution 141512, uh, Board of Education, Columbus City Elementary, and Union High School Districts, adopting the GAN limit. So moved. Second. Discussion on that? This is an annual thing. Mm -hmm. Routine. No? Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, Sue, and finally, resolution uh, 23 is resolution 141513, Board of Education, Columbus City, Elementary, and National Districts, County of Sonoma, State of California, confirming appointment of Citizens Bond Oversight Committee members. So moved. Second. Yeah. I saw the list. Yeah. Yep. Right. So we pretty much received um, applications for each of the slots and nothing more. There was one person who um, did apply um, over and above. Um, she could could have been considered, but we her child is now at St. Vincent's and we just opted to fill it with the other existing people. And that's been said. I'm sorry. Submitted to you as the recommended list. For and was it properly advertised? In yes. Uh, yes. Yep. It was posted in the newspaper. All the requirements um, that are, were. Are any of these on the parcel tax committee? Yes. So they cut double duty. Yes, and actually the the plan was because it is so difficult to get people to participate in these committees um, was to run the meetings back to back. Oh, on one oh, evening yeah. and and That's take a good idea. yes yeah. That's great. Um, okay. so. Efficiencies. Refresh my recollect, Midge, on how do they figure out how it staggers? 
Because I know, I remember I, there was a stagger requirement, right, for mm -hmm. terms. So how, was that based on what uh, group or, or category you're in, or was that a random? How did, how did you come to, how do we decide? Um, you decided it was the meeting itself. Okay. But it's one, two, three, as I recall, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Couple of one, couple of two, and so yeah. on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right, any other questions? No. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. No passes. Uh, date for special board meeting. So I'm proposing um, October 7th. Is that a Tuesday? That's a Tuesday. Um, because Tuesday is typically the day we shoot for. Um, it's, so it's the first Tuesday. And um, have the board interview candidates for um, the CBO position. Tanya, you want to do it? Does that work for everybody? <clears throat> yeah, I'm flying in from Tennessee that day. Oh. And so that means I'll miss the district leadership team meeting. We're going to move the in. district leadership oh. team meeting. Good. Yep. Right. To accommodate this meeting. So, Mary, is that work for you then? Yeah. If we do it. Right. In the evening would be better. So, evening. so do you want to go 7 o'clock to be safe? Oh, no, no, no. I, I'll be back in the morning. It's okay. okay. Oh, okay. Can we go 6? So, no, that's good. I mean, our, that's our typical time to go yeah, 6, yeah. but I just want to make sure Mary is going to be back in time yeah. for. So, 6, six o'clock on the 7th. 7th? On the, um, seven. Seven? Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to uh, adjourn a closed session to finish up uh, items from the original closed session this evening, and we will...